Hello, and welcome to Python for Informatics. Right now we're going to cover Chapter 1. I'm Charles Severance from the University of Michigan, and I'm the author, and I'll be your lecturer for this online lecture of the first chapter of the book. This lecture and my slides and the book, as a matter of fact, are all open. Open content, open materials. They're copyright Creative Commons attribution. And this video recording is also copyright Creative Commons attribution. It's important to be explicit about copyright, and so I say it right at the beginning. So computers basically want to be helpful. They are programmed. Matter of fact, this is a microprocessor. This is really just an electrical part. It's got wires and circuits inside of it, and somebody spent a lot of engineering time to make it so that these pins in the back take instructions from us, from operating systems, from the hard drive, from the memory. Instructions come into here and then results come out. It's really sort of a very programmable hand calculator, and it's our job to put instructions in. This thing, in a sense, is wired to be curious about what's next, right? It's like, it, it's like, tell me what you want to do next. What do you want to do next? What do you want to do next? And after that, what do you want to do next? And it just happens to do that a billion or so times a second. And so that's sort of the, the low level piece. And, but you can also think if you have like a PDA, something like this, all the buttons on here are some kind of, you know, what's next, right? Each of those is sort of something begging for my attention. Some application developer who's built a really cool application and says, please use me, please click me. I am sort of nothing without you. We com humans are the things that sort of cause computers to start doing something. And this will sit here happily until I've caused it to do something. Now, whoa, whoa, hope it's still okay. Yeah, seems to be fine, seems to be fine. Takes a lick in and keeps on ticking. So these anyone can use, right? They say even animals can use a Macintosh uh, smartphone. Um, and so you don't have to be a programmer. But to get this to do what you want, you need to learn a different language. And we need to learn the language of the instructions to tell it what to do. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to learn how to talk to this. Yo, because it's asking us a question. We have to give the answer. So, what's a programmer? A programmer is somebody who writes a program, which is a script or a set of instructions that tell one of these kinds of things what it is that they're supposed to do. And sometimes you're writing a program like Moodle, an open source learning management system, or Sakai, another open source learning management system, and sometimes you'll even get paid to do that, right? Sometimes you do it for free, sometimes you get paid. Sometimes you write things for yourself. And, uh, and But if you think about it, all these applications on my iPhone, somebody's making some money off of these. They may not be able to quit their job, but a surprising number have been able to quit their job or start small companies. Maybe not gigantic companies, but small companies. So these, these people that can put applications inside of our computers are programmers because they understand the way that we talk to these computers. And part of what I'm going to try to do is to get you to move from the mindset of the end user who thinks of this as something just to click on to the mindset of the programmer who's kind of on the inside trying to get out to you. So that's as we sort of move from user to programmer, we move from outside to inside. And we think of the world out there. It's like, what are they going to put? push? What button are they going to push? So here's kind of a picture of that. So on the outside, we're users. We click on buttons. We click on websites. We click on buttons on our phones, et cetera, et cetera. But what's really going on inside of all that is there's a computer with a bunch of hardware inside of that. And it has inside of it data, networks, other information. And software is what makes all that make sense. And so part of what I want you to do is I want you to stop thinking about how to use these things from the outside. And we move to becoming a programmer. We're someone on the inside. We're with the CPU. We're with the memory. We are with the network connection. We are doing things on behalf of the user and presenting them back up to the user. So why be a programmer? Now, this class is specifically not trying to turn you into a professional programmer, even though I'd be very proud if after five, ten more classes, 
You were a professional programmer, but that's not the purpose of this class. Sometimes you just want to get something done. You got an Excel spreadsheet at work and the date is not right. You got the data from somebody else and it's got like extra spaces where it shouldn't have it or the missing fields or something. You got to do something to it that Excel can't do and you're, you're stuck like saying, oh, I want to I want to mess with this data and put it in Excel so I can do my job, but it's a pain in the neck and I have to sit and bring it into a text editor like Microsoft Word and go line by line and make all kinds of mistakes and clean the data up. You can write a program to do that and that's the kind of programs we're going to do. Programs that serve our needs inside the computer but to serve our needs. Professional programmers tend to build things for other people to use, right? They, they tend to build things that everyone else does, but we're going to build stuff primarily for ourselves. So, what is code? What is software? We use these words pretty much independently, a program. It's really a sequence of stored instructions. We learn the language that this talks and then we will feed the instructions in one at a time. It takes them one at a time, it gives us back a result, we give it a next one. To give it back, in, out, in, out. So it's really a sequence of stored instructions, but it's kind of more than that. It's, it's sort of like our creativity. And if you've been using some of my software, like my MOOC software, I spent about a month writing all that stuff. And it's like, it's me. I mean, I'm, it's my vision of how cool stuff ought to work, right? And so it's more than just getting something done. It's also a sense of pride and a sense of accomplishment, especially if you're giving something that other people can make use of. It's really, I think it's very creative. And it's what attracted me to being a programmer in the first place is that I could... I could leverage the capabilities inside of here and I could do things, the cool things, on behalf of the user. So, code, software, a program. So, let's get a non-technical example of this. So, I'll have you link out to the YouTube <coughs> for this. This is the Macarena. The Macarena is a song that has with it a well-known dance that everyone seems to know or either get taught very quickly. So I'll, I'll stop and let you uh, watch the Macarena and then come back. So welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, in a sense, what we've got there is a program, a program for human beings. Um, and maybe you learned that at a club or something and they told you what to do next. Well, I can teach you how to do the Macarena by writing a simple program right now. So here's my Macarena. While the music plays, means you do it over and over and over again, to the beat, that's kind of like computers, they do things in a beat, they happen to have three billion beats a second, but as it were. So we're going to do this multiple times, so we have this whole group of instructions that we're going to do, right? Uh, left hand out and up, right hand out and up, flip left hand, flip right hand, left hand to right shoulder, right hand to left shoulder, etc., etc. Now, this particular little program has a mistake in it. Actually, several. I want you to look and see if you can find the mistakes in the program. Okay, so here are the places that have the mistake, right? The mistake is right hand to the back of the head and left hand to right hit not hip. Now, if you're in a bar and you take a ham and you hit somebody in the back of the head, that's not very nice when you're dancing to this song. These are what's called bugs. Now, a human reading this would say, oh, I think they meant to say hand here. But a computer is much more literal than people. We'll, we'll see a couple of exercises where we'll see that people can correct little mistakes like this, but computers, they cannot, right? So we have to fix these bugs, and we have to say right hand, and we have to say hip when we mean hip. So we have to be explicit. Computers do exactly what we say. They don't do what we mean to do. So let's clear that. Here's another example. Okay, let's see how this comes out. You're supposed to count the number of times the word the appears in this sentence. Count it. And the word the, how many times? Okay. 
your turn. Now here, this is not something humans are good at. I moved it around, I played a little music, I confused you, I put a picture of a clown car in the upper left hand corner, etc, etc, etc. Now it turns out that computers, once we tell them what to do, are very good at concentration. It can easily go through 30 words and find the most common word, or 3 million words and find the most common word, and it'll never make a mistake. But we first have to give it a set of instructions. So I don't want you to learn this right now, but this is a Python program. Let's say that I wanted to let you count words in files. Okay? I say, hey, I know how to program Python. I'll send you an email, and I'll send you this program. Just stick it into Python, and it'll count words for you. Right? You got a million words, a million lines in a file. You want to find the most common word. And so, so here we go. So I will send you this file called words.py. I spend a little time. It's a friendly gift to you. And this is what I type in. Now I'll give you kind of an outline of what this is going to do. The uh, first thing it's going to do is open a file and read it. Then it's going to split the lines and files into words based on the spaces. Then it's going to run through and accumulate numbers like, you know, this word is one, this word is one. Oh, I saw that one again, so I turn that to two. That's what this does. It's a loop. It goes round and round and round, one for each word. Then what we're going to do is we're going to another, write another loop that's going to figure out which is the most common word by looking through all those little histograms that we built up. And then it's going to print those things out at the very end. And this can certainly do python words.py and read clown.txt and tell us that the word the occurs seven times. But you know, it can go, it can find out that a different thing has the word two and occurs 16 times. And it's just as fast. And it's so, so the, so yeah, you have to learn a language and you have to tell it what to do. But once you do, it'll do it for a million or a billion words and be happily. And so you don't have to do menial work once you understand the way to instruct the computer to do menial work. So, we always start all programming classes with hardware architecture. I don't think it's essential, so don't get too excited about it. It's a good use of terminology so we can have some words. I can say like CPU and you don't freak out, or memory, or RAM, or a disk drive, and you don't freak out. Um, I don't want to turn you into hardware nut. I just want you to kind of have a few words so we can talk about what's going on inside because, in a sense, we're going to be writing programs to do stuff, both data, instructions, etc. So, Here's some hardware that I just bought a couple of weeks ago and I'm really in love with, and that is the Raspberry Pi. This is a single board, board computer. Um, it's got storage on an SD card right there. That's the operating system and the data. And it's got the uh, uh, um, both a microprocessor and the memory is in here as well. And it hooks up with USB and HDMI and various things. And if you want, in this course, you probably can do all of the homework using a Raspberry Pi if you so desire. So this is what hardware really looks like. It's kind of the inside of something. Normally it's in some kind of case and you don't get to see it. And that's what it looks like. It's kind of got this green and little silver and gold. It's, I think they're very beautiful. They're very pretty. A lot of engineering goes into making these things. And, uh, and so we kind of have a block diagram of what's going on in here. And there's some just some terminology. The, the brains of it all, well, we draw this block diagram partly because, and here's is a, a, from a, well, parts are coming off of this. Oh, yeah. I don't know what that was. It's okay. He's broken anyways. And if you have a desktop computer, this is more like what it looks like inside. This part is called a motherboard. And it's kind of like the thing that connects and brings everything together. It's got a bunch of wires. Each one of those little lines here is wire. It's covered with sort of a lacquer. And then there are things that penetrate the board and then connect to various chips. And this whole thing is what this picture is. But it really is connecting a number of different components. The central processing unit that I've spoken of before, put that back down, central processing unit is the closest thing a computer has to a brain, but it's barely a brain. It's really just a super fast programmable calculator. It, we make it flexible by our creativity when we write programs. We make it seem intelligent. It's people that make it intelligent by taking our own knowledge 
and putting it in, this is not itself intelligent. There's nothing to fear from this. It's just not that smart. So this is the thing that's programmed to ask the question, what's next? And then we have to have a set of instructions that feed this thing really fast, billions of times a second. And that's what this is. This is the random access memory. And we have memory chips, and, and they're connected together through the motherboard. So we have the main memory, and we have the central processing unit. And this is where our high-speed instructions come from. This is where our high-speed data is stored. And this is the thing that asks what next, and it reads its instructions from here. And you'll see they're kind of like, boop, they're not quite connected together, but eventually they're kind of connected together. Don't feel too bad about this hardware. It's all old, and it's all broken, and it can't be hurt. So the next thing we got is input-output devices. I'll go back to my Raspberry Pi. So the Raspberry Pi has a USB that you can connect a mouse or a keyboard. It has a HDMI that you can connect a monitor to. It has an Ethernet connector. So these are all examples of input-output devices. And, uh, and then the last thing on the screen is the secondary memory. So this RAM, on the Raspberry Pi, the CPU, the central processing unit, and the RAM are all in this one chip in the middle. It's called SOC, or System on a Chip, where they put more parts there. So in a sense, they've collapsed this and this and a lot of this all down in a Raspberry Pi to one little guy. But it's still architecturally the same thing. There's a central processing unit, there's main memory, there's graphics cards, etc. So input output devices, oh and this big this guy has input output devices too, like USB and keyboard and monitor, etc. So they're they're very similar. It's just this is new and this is old. Everything gets smaller when it gets newer. Okay. Okay. So the last thing we got to talk about is the secondary memory. Oh. When the power goes off, these things sort of go away. The data in this RAM goes away. It's just designed to be really fast, but not permanent. So we need a place that's permanent. That's what secondary storage is. That's what, that's what this secondary storage is for. This is permanent. This is fast, and it cha-cha-cha-cha-cha really fast, and, um, but this is permanent, and this is slower, okay? So the secondary memory, I've got two kinds of secondary memory. Oh, dropped it on the floor. Two kinds of secondary memory. I'll start with the Raspberry Pi. The secondary memory of the Raspberry Pi is this SD card. It's like a disk drive. It still is permanent does not require power to maintain its data. The data stays permanent. So in the future, we will see more of these flash-style drives and SD-style drives. So the Raspberry Pi is kind of alluding to the future. There's a disk drive in here. It's not really a disk. It's also flash memory. But in the old days, in the good old days, back when I was a kid, we our secondary memory was a disk drive. And it had platters and it spun and it made a satisfying noise and it would move in and out to read data and I'll show you a video of this just in a bit and so this would record the data on the magnetic platters and then when the power is taken off the data would still be magnetized and then it would go and move to the right spot spin it around and read the data and again this is kinda messed up in a pretty bad way so there we go central processing unit brains of the operation Main memory, fast, but goes away when we power off. Input-output devices, keyboards, etc. And then storage that has maintains its data across power cycles. Okay. And I just said all that. Okay. So then the question is, where do you belong in this? Where do programs live? Where do we write? And the answer is, we kind of live in the memory, right? What we do is we put our programs into the memory and then the CPU pulls the programs out of the memory. So we have to write our programs and put them into the memory. When we start them and run them, we're really loading them into the memory so they can be fed rapidly to the CPU. Now the computers don't really execute Python like if x less than 3 print, but that's what we tend to want to write because what the computers really execute is a thing called machine languages, which is a series of zeros and ones that pretty much translate directly 
to what's on these pins. There's voltages that go up and down. That's called machine language. Source code, like Python, is written in a way that's most convenient. Well, at least more convenient. Machine language is what's most convenient for the hardware. So we either we have to translate from source code to machine language, and that's what the Python program does for us. We write in Python, and Python translates to machine language for us. So I got a couple of videos that give you a sense of how this all works. We'll start with uh, CPU. And what this is going to do is this is going to show you the intensity of how much electricity. The thing that go, gets hot inside your computer is this little guy right here. And we're going to see in this video just how hot it can get. Okay, so welcome back. So the next thing I'm going to show you, I showed you a hard disk that sort of didn't work, but we're actually going to show you a real short video on how a hard disk works that someone took the cover off and actually applied power to it. You don't want to do this yourself if you have a hard drive. Um, I've read and some people say that you can do it for a, for a few minutes and then the drive kind of destroys itself if you run it with the, the cover off. So let's take a look at this. Okay, so that sentence is now paragraphs. Let's talk about paragraphs. Paragraphs are the combination of sentences to make sort of a thought together. Multiple sentences, multiple lines. So the interactive Python that I just showed you is fine for running one, two, or five, or six commands. But ultimately, we're going to write much longer bits of Python. And so we write what's called a Python script or a Python program, and we put these in a file. And, we, and, and if you went through the prerequisite, you will see have seen me edit in a text editor, save the file, and then run from the Python file. Okay? And so we call these files, put .py on the end of them, .py on the end of them, and we're giving Python a script to execute. <clears throat> so, interactive, you're typing directly into Python, and it's doing it right as you're talking. You're still doing it in an order, and the order does matter, in a script, you type it all into a file once and say, Python, do it all. Now, when you write one of these things, there are patterns for combining these. There are things that we do to these lines that sort of treat them differently. It's like a recipe, a set of instructions. Start at the beginning, but it's a little more complex than that. Some steps are just sequential. Some steps might be skipped, some steps we do multiple times, and other times we have kind of like a set of steps we do over and over again. So here's some pictures. And here's a four lines of Python, a little simple paragraph. And it's got a sentence that says x equals 2, print x, x equals x plus 2, which says go grab the old value of x, add 2 to it, stick it back in x, and print x. So the output of this program is 2, then 4. Because x was 2, we printed it, then we added 2 to it, and then we printed it again, so it was 4. Now, these flowcharts, don't worry, I'm not going to make you draw these. I just draw these in case, cognitively, it makes it easier for you to understand what's going on. So, x equals 1 is the first step. Sequentially, it just continues on. It runs the print. x equals x plus 1 runs the print. So this is just straight through. It'll make more sense when we see a little more convoluted things. So this program just starts naturally. Python starts at the beginning and works its way down through the end. That's sequential stuff. That's the normal order of business. Now, a conditional is a step that may or may not get executed. If all we did was sequential steps, programs would be kind of dull, right? They would just be like, blah, 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 stop. So there's things like, oh, what if you do this or what if you do that? And so we do things like if if you have more than 40 hours, I'm going to pay you a different rate than if I have under 40 hours. Those kinds of things are if, the word if. So in Python, the way we express this is we use the keyword if. So we say x equals 5, and then we say if x is less than 10, this is a question that's being asked. Is x less than 10 or not? Yes or no? If it is, we execute the indented bit. If it's not, we skip it. In this case, since x is 5, we execute it. And then we come back here, and we're going to do another one. 
if x is greater than 20, well, this turns out to be false. So we skip that. So bigger does not run. That line never runs. So we, the output is smaller, fini. Now, here we can take a look at it sort of in the picture diagram. We run x equals 5. We ask a question. This doesn't hurt x to ask the question. Is x less than 10? The answer is yes, so we kind of drive down this little path. We print smaller, and then we rejoin the freeway. Is x less than 20? No, so we skip, and we continue. So this never gets executed. So you can think of it either way. You can think of it either sort of like gestalt, say, if this is true, do what's indented. Or you can imagine sort of a little car driving down a highway, making turn choices as it goes. They're equivalent. Over time, it's probably you'll just start seeing this and start thinking this way, but sometimes it helps to think about it this way for a little while. Okay. Now, the next thing I want to show you is repeated steps, steps that happen over and over and over again. Okay? And that again, when I said, oh, computers are good at handling a billion words, well, that means it has to have a loop or a repeated section, one for each word. It's going to do something for each word. And so, um, so here we go, and in Python, let's pick a different festive color. Let's pick purple as a festive color. So here's our program, starts at the beginning, sets the variable n to 5, and then a keyword, reserved word while, while n greater than 0, again this is asking a question, this is asking a question, is n greater than 0, that's a question, if yes we're going to do this, if no we're going to do that, over here, if it's true, we're going to execute the indented part and then come back and do it again. If it's false, we're going to skip down. So it's kind of like an if, except it keeps doing it over and over and over again. So it comes in, sets n to 5. Is n greater than 0? Yeah, sure. So we print n, out comes 5. Then it says n equals n minus 1, so n becomes 4. We can change colors. Then it goes back up goes back up and asks the question again. And it's 4. It's still greater than 0. So it comes through. Prints out 4, subtracts 1, so n is now 3. Goes back up. Is n 0? Is n greater than 0? Yes, it is. Print out 3, subtract 1. Now it's 2. So out come 3 and 2. Then it goes back up. Still greater than 0? Yes, it is. Print out 2. Or oh, wait, now it's 1. <coughs> now we subtract 1, it becomes 0. Is it greater than 0? No, and we finally leave. And we finally drop down. And so the last thing that comes out is the print of blast off. So this is a loop. The notion that we're going to run this little bit of code five times. <coughs> Excuse me. We're going to run this little bit of code five times. And loops have these things we call iteration variables. And that is this n. It's a variable that specifically is changing each time it goes through the loop. And that way we can sort of control the loop. We can decide when it starts and when it stops. We can tell if we're at the beginning or the end, or the first one or the last one. We'll do a lot of stuff with loops. This is an iteration variable because we iterate, repeatedly iterate through the loop. Okay. Any questions? <laughs> Can't do questions. Okay. So now, if we go back to the little story that I... You've got several chapters to understand. Don't worry. You actually got like through chapter 9. So don't try to understand this program right now. I'm just trying to give you a sense of what the picture is going to be. Right? So, so here are some sequential statements because they aren't indented. Those five lines are sequential. They just go one after the other. Then we have 4, and it's indented. This is a loop. This is going to run a bunch of times. Then we're done with that. We do some more sequential stuff. Now we have a for loop, and that's going to run a bunch of times. And then we have an if, which may or may not run. So these, this little block of code is conditionally executed based on something, and here's the question that we're asking. So that's the question. And then at the end, we do a print. Now, again, 
Don't try to make too much sense of this. I'm just trying to show you sequential, repeated, repeated, conditional. Okay? Just those concepts show up in every pro pretty much every program that we build. So, <clears throat> let's do a couple more little exercises that get you sort of in the mindset of being a programmer and how programmers tend to have to think about problems a little bit differently. So here we go. This I call this an animated short story. And your job, I'm going to give you a diff se several sets of numbers, and I want you to find the largest number in the list of numbers. Now, it's not so important to know what the large number is, but also to think about how your mind attacks the problem. What your eyes are doing, what your mind is doing, how you break a bigger problem down into smaller problems, how a human solves this problem, and then we'll focus on how a computer might have to look at the problem differently. Okay? So don't just like get the answer. That's not so important. Think about how you get the answer. So don't just like scroll ahead in your YouTube and cheat and go get the answer. Think about actually solving the problem and then monitor what your brain is thinking as it goes. So here we go. So I'm going to give you a list of numbers and you are to tell me what the largest number is. Ready, set, go. I didn't make it easy. You're looking for the largest number. Did you get it? Did you get it? Did you have to go back a couple of times? Actually, I don't care what the answer is. The question is, how was your brain solving? Okay, you probably want to know what it is. The answer is 198. That was the largest number. Of course, what I was doing is I was moving it to make it difficult. But here's the thing. How do humans look at this? Like, do humans like, did you look at 25, then you looked at 1, then you looked at 114? And did you just look at them slowly, one at a time, like this? Or no? I doubt it. If you are, maybe you're a computer. Maybe I'm talking to computers. Maybe you're all computers. I'm certainly not a computer. Maybe you're all computers. Okay, enough of that. No, that's probably not how you did it. What you probably did was you had your eyes move around the whole thing very rapidly, and the first thing that you figured out is that there were one-digit blobs. There were small, medium, and large blobs of purple. And the first thing you knew right away was there was no point at looking at any of the small blobs. Your brain just threw the blobs away really quick. Then you say, okay, given that it, there's no four-digit numbers, there are three-digit numbers. Then what you probably did is you started looking for the first digit. You say, look, there's some ones. Is there any twos? Quickly you decided there are no twos. So you knew that you had to look for the big blobs, and the second digit was probably the thing that mattered. Then you start getting to the nine. You say, okay, there's some nines. So that means it's it's one nine something. Then that was the part that you probably had to go check to find the oh where the heck was the one ninety ah oh one ninety eight right there <laughs> yeah I color coded I couldn't even see it okay but the point is is humans are great at eliminating sort of bad solutions really fast. And you probably looked at how big, how much purple was on the screen, eliminating the areas that were less purple because you knew that your brain quickly and instinctively knew that the more purple meant a larger number. Computers don't do any of that. They don't do any of that. So, in order to make you feel a little more like a computer, I have another test. And again, the goal is not just to find the largest number, but to, to monitor as you go what your brain is thinking while you're doing this. Okay? Do you get it? How are you attacking the problem? What is your feeling as you're attacking the problem? Are you a computer or not? Here we go. I'm only going to give you a few seconds.
So, what did you get? My guess is that most of you just said, I don't care. This is such a hard problem. It's a stupid problem, or I'll try to turn my head upside down, or something. It's a really hard problem. The other one was kind of easy. Not that you might, you might not have got it, but you had this natural instinct that allowed you to approach the problem. Okay, I'll show you what the right answer is. The right answer is right there. It is 197. Yay. Right. I, you can't even, even if I tell you, it's, you know, there you are. What, you know, what is this? Is this 500 or 2? Zero, zero. <laughs> Actually, the only way I can do this is I flip it to find it. I mean, it's just not what humans are good at. This is a little bit more like how computers see the world. But the, the fact that the data is frontwards or backwards should sort of make no difference, right? Computers d need a strategy. We need to give them a strategy. Okay. So here we go. <clears throat> One last experiment. Now, I'm going to show you numbers one at a time. And at the end, I want you to tell me what the largest number that you saw was. Ready? Here we go. First number. What was the largest number? As a matter of fact, how did you solve that problem? You solved that problem most likely because you didn't you couldn't look at all the numbers at the same time, so you probably created a variable in your head without even knowing it. And you put into that variable, you called the variable the largest number I've seen so far. And you hadn't seen any, so the, let's say the largest number you've seen so far is negative one. Then I showed you three. And you said to yourself, well, negative one is no longer the largest number I've seen, so I'm gonna keep that one. I'll keep three, that's the largest I've seen so far. And now I see 41, ah, oh, 41 is larger than three, so I will keep that and now I see 12. Now 12 is crap because it's nowhere near as good as 41, so I'm keeping 41. 74, oh, 9. 9, not nearly as good as 41, so I'm going to throw that one away. 74, better, better, keep it, keep that one. So I'll keep 74. And the last number is 15. Don't even know it's the last number, but we don't want to keep that one. And so now we're done. And so we know that at the end, what was during the loop the largest so far is the actual largest of all the numbers. And we don't remember exactly how many numbers there were. So that's kind of like thinking like a program. You have this kind of sliding window. It didn't matter if I gave you a billion numbers or five numbers. I think there were five numbers, actually. This notion of the largest so far is a powerful notion. As a matter of fact, it's central to the program I've been showing you. I don't want you to try to understand this, but this part in the purple, this part in the purple is really saying, I'm going to loop through the counts of all the, all the words. So it's got a word like the is 15 times and clown is four times. And it's going to look through all the pairs of word value combinations. And it's going to basically say, I'm going to go through the counts that I have and I'm going to check to see if the count I'm looking at is bigger than the biggest count I've seen so far. And if it is, I'm going to remember it. Now, don't worry about this. We haven't even covered any of this stuff. That's what chapter 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. But this is an algorithm, a paragraph, a pattern that allows you to find the largest number. And we'll look at this again in great detail in upcoming chapters. So this is kind of thinking like a computer having a sliding window across a long list of numbers and coming up with something that is the answer that you need. Okay, so that's the end of this lecture. Read chapter one.
write your Hello World program. Make sure if you haven't, get Python installed. As you read this chapter, and even as you install Python, and even as you write the first program, don't get too stuck on the details. I was confused for like eight weeks, or probably six weeks, in my first programming class. You'll be confused too. Just sort of wander through with me. Keep at it. It will start making sense at some point that's up to you. I can't tell you when it's going to make sense. So if don't sort of stare at everything until you get it. Just kind of keep digging in and keep understanding and keep playing. And sooner or later, this will make a lot of sense to you. I promise you. See you next lecture. Hello, and welcome to Chapter 2. Hope you uh, enjoyed Chapter 1. It was a, one of the longer lectures, uh, trying to motivate you a little bit. Um, and now we're going to kind of go back to the basics. Uh, the Chapter chapter 1 covered sort of the first four to five chapters of the book. So, um, as always, these uh, this video, these slides, are copyright Creative Commons attribution, as well as the audio. And so, now we're going to talk about sort of the really low-level things that make up the Python language. Um, constants. So I'm gonna, some of this is terminology just so I can like say the word constant and you won't freak out. Uh, constant is as contrasted with something that changes is variable. We'll talk about variables in the next slide, but for now constants. Constants are in things that are sort of natural and instinctive. Things like uh, numbers, 123, 98.6, or hello world. And so in, in what, what I'm doing here is we're we're using the Python interpreter, and that how you, that's how you can tell the Chevron prompt. And I'm saying print 123, and then Python responds with 123. Print 98.6, Python responds with 98.6. And print single quote, hello world, single quote. So the constants are the 123, 98.6, and quote, hello world, quote. So these are things we can use either single quotes or double quotes to uh, make strings. And so programs kind of work with numbers and work with strings, and we have these non-varying values that we call constants. So the other side of the picture is the variable. And the way I like to characterize a variable is it's a place in the memory of the computer. Uh, we give it a name as a programmer. We pick the variable name. In this I'm saying x equals 12.2 and uh, y equals 14. I am choosing the name and I'm choosing what to put in there. Uh, this is a statement called an assignment statement. And the way to think of the assignment statement is that it sort of has a direction. We're saying, Dear Python, go find some memory. I will use the label x later to, re to refer to that memory and take the number 12.2 and stick it into x. Then, this is sequential code, then the next thing I want you to do is I'd like you to go find some more memory, call it y. I will call it y later. And, uh, stick 14 in there. Okay, and so that ends up sort of with two little areas of memory. You know, one labeled X, and here's a little cell in which we'd like a drawer or something. And one labeled Y, and we put have 12.2 after these lines run. We have 12.2 in one and 14 in the other. Then, for example, if there's another line that's down here, so there's this third line after this has happened, after this has happened, x equals 100. Remember, this has kind of got an, a direction to it. Say, oh, remember that x that I had? You know, I would like now to put 100 in that. So as I'm thinking this through, I think of that as sort of removing the 12.2 or overwriting the 12.2 and putting 100 in its place. And so at the end here, x is left with 100 and y is left with, one four, uh, with, with 14. So these variables can kind of have one value in them, and but we can look at them and we can reuse them and put different values in if we want. There's some rules for naming your variables. Again, you get to pick the variable names. Um, often we pick variables that make some sense. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, in Python, uh, variables can start with an underscore. We tend not to, as normal programmers, use those. We let libraries use those. Um, it has to have letters, numbers, and underscores, and, and uh, start with uh, start with a letter or an underscore. A case matters, so uh, spam is good, eggs is spam good, spam 23 is good because the number is not the first character. 
underscore speed, that's also perfectly fine because it starts with an underscore or a letter. <coughs> 23 spam starts with a letter, uh, starts with a number, so that's bad. This starts with something other than a letter or an underscore. And you can't use a dot in the, in the variable name. It turns out the dot has meaning to Python that would confuse it. That would confuse it and wouldn't understand <clears throat> what we really mean there, and so that would be a syntax error. That would be a syntax error. Um, because case is sensitive, that means that things like all lowercase spam is different than an uppercase s and all uppercase. These are three distinct variables that are unique. Um, most people don't you choose variables that might be so confusing. So this, to you as you write it and as to anybody that might read it, would find three variables named as very confusing. So it's a bad idea. Don't do it. But I'm just showing you as an example that case can make a variable name distinct. And again, this variable is a place in memory that we are going to store and retrieve uh, information, whether it be numbers or strings or whatever. These are things that we control. Now, Python also has a set of reserved words. And what it really means is you can't use these for variables. These words have very special meaning. And, for, is, raise, if. So you can't make a variable named if. It'll be like, oh no, that is if. I know what if is. And so these are words that Python has as its core vocabulary and forbids you to use them for other purposes like variable names or later function names. So that's kind of the vocabulary, constants, variables, and uh, reserved words. Now, we take these and we start assembling them into sort of sentences, statements, Python statements that do something. So we've already talked about an assignment statement. It has kind of an arrow here that says, hey, Python, go find me a place called x. Take the number 2 and stick it in there for later, then continue on. Now, because there's, a, there's an arrow, the right side of this is done first. And so, it's a, so this right side, you can kind of ignore for the moment the left-hand side, and it calculates the right-hand side by looking at the current value for x, which happens to be 2, then it adds these two things together, and then gets 4. And then, at the point where it knows 4, that this number is 4, it will then store that back into x. And so then, later, we print x, and we will get the 4. And so, again, this is a sequence of steps, and the, the variable x changes as these steps continue. And when we're saying print x, that really means print the current value for x. So, operator, we can do a number of different operators in assignment statements. We calculate this right-hand side. This is sort of all calculated, whatever this is, based on the current value for x, does this calculation. And then when it knows what the answer is, it assigns that into the variable that's on the left-hand side of the assignment statement. Again, calculate the right-hand side completely and then move it to the left-hand side. Some early languages actually didn't use the equal sign for the assignment operator, this assignment operator, and in a way it kind of... Um, some languages, an early language, actually used an arrow. Arrows aren't really on people's keyboards. Uh, another language used colon equals as this assignment operator, but we use equals. Now, if you're familiar with math, this can be a little confusing, like x equals 1 and then x equals 2. That, as mathematics, would be bad math because in a proof for a problem, x can only have one value. But in programming, if this was two statements, that means just x had a value and then the value for x changed later. Okay, so just kind of go through this. Because it's working from the right-hand side to the left-hand side on assignment statements, it is pulling out these x values. So x may have 0 0.6. It pulls the values out before it's sort of ignoring this part right here, and it's just going to try to resolve this expression. And it has multiplication and parentheses and things like that. So it basically pulls the 0 0.6 into the calculation, does the 1 minus x, which gives you 0 0.4, then it multiplies these three things together, giving 0 0.93, and then when it is all done with all of that, it takes that, oops, takes that 0 0.93, and then puts it back into x. And so this is just sort of emphasizing how the right-hand side is computed to produce a value, 
then it is moved into the variable in and that is why you can have sort of x on both sides because this is like the old and this is the new this is the old x participates in the calculation and then when the calculation is done it becomes the new x hope that makes sense so this on the right hand side here is a numeric expression so we have a number of different operators some of them are instinctive intuitive um, the plus and the minus. The reason some of these are so weird is in the really old days we didn't have too many things on the keyboard and a, a lot of programs were very mathematical and so they figured out what was on the keyboard of the computer equipment of the day and then they had to uh, fake certain things. So it turns out that plus and minus were on the keyboard and so plus and minus are addition and subtraction respectively. There was no kind of times operator for multiplication and dot was used for decimal points, so they used asterisk for multiplication. So in computers, languages, nearly all of them, uh, they basically use a multi a times for multiplication. Slash is used for division, so we say like 8 slash 2, which is 8 divided by 2. Um, raising something to the power, like a 4 squared, that is double asterisk. And then remainder is if you uh, do a division, uh, that gives you the remainder rather than the divisor. So 8 over 2 is 4, remainder 0. So the remainder is what you get with this particular operator. There's a few cool things that we can do with remainder that we won't talk about right away. But uh, it's there. And so here's just a couple of uh, sample expressions. Um, that's giving me green. Okay. So, so again, I'm using the Python interpreter, so you can kind of, this is just the prompt, these chevrons are the prompt. Uh, create the variable xx and assign it to 2. Uh, retrieve the old value in an addition, then print it out, and put it back into xx, so xx has 4. yy, this is a multiplication, 440 times 12 is 5,280. yy over 1,000, now this is a little counterintuitive. This, because yy is an integer, it then does it in a truncated division. And so 5,280 divided by 1,000 is 5. Now, if, and, and so that's, that's an integer division. We'll see in a second about floating point division. Um, now we take the variable jj and we set it to 23. And now we're going to use the modular or modulo or remainder operator to say what is jj, what is the remainder when we divide this jj by 5? And so if you think about this, we take old long division, 23 divided by 5, you end up with 4, and then remainder 3. The modulo operator, or the percent, or the remainder operator, gives us back this number. And so that's why kk is 3. It is the remainder of 23 when divided by 5, or the remainder of the division of 5 into 23. And the raising to the power, 4 cubed, no, that's not so nice. 4 cubed is 4 star star 3. And so that ends up being 64. So that's just operations. Now, just like in algebra and mathematics, um, we have rules about when to, uh, when, which operations happen first. In general, things like uh, the power happens before the multiplication and division, and then the addition and subtraction happen. And so there are some rules that when you're looking at an expression and trying to calculate what its value is, if you don't have parentheses, it follows these rules. And so the, the, most imp the, the, the rule that sort of trumps all the rules is that parentheses are always respected. So a lot of us just write these with parentheses in place, even sometimes though you don't need it. Then after parentheses have been handled, then it does exponentiation. Then it does multiplication, division, and remainder and then it does addition and subtraction, and then when it, all else being equal, it just works left to right. So let's, let's look through an example. So here is a calculation that is, you know, one, 1 plus 2 times 3 divided by 4 over 5, and the question is, what order does this happen? Okay, and so let's, let's sort of take a look at this. And so we start with, uh, are there any parentheses? And the answer is no, there are no parentheses. So let's go next. Um, power. And so the, the power 
says, okay, let's look across and find those things that are raised to a power, and the 2 cubed, or 2 to the third power, is the, the power. So we're going to do that one, okay? And then we can, the way I do it when I'm sort of doing these slowly is I rewrite it. So the 2 to the third power becomes 8, so it's 1 plus 8 over 4 times 5. And then now we can say, oh, power, that's taken care of. Now we're going to do multiplication and division, and we go across. Now we have both a division and a multiplication. Okay, and multiplication and division are done at the same time. So that means we do left to right, which means we do the first one that we encounter first. And so that will be <coughs> 8 over 4 because of the left to right rule. And so we find that one, and that's the one that gets computed next. And that turns into 2. And again, I like to rewrite these expressions just to keep my brain really, really clear. After a while, you just do it in your head. But I rewrite them when I was first learning it. At least I rewrote it all the time. And, uh, and so next, looking at this, there's a multiplication. We're not done with multiplication yet. So the 2 over 5 is the next thing. And then we do that calculation, and that becomes 10. And again, we rewrite it. And now we've done the multiplication. And we're going to do addition next, and that's just 1 over 10, and that becomes 11. And so basically, this big long thing, through a series of successive steps, becomes 11. And indeed, when we print it out, that's what we get. Okay. So there's the rules that are parentheses, power, multiplication, addition, and then left to right. But smart people usually just put parentheses in. You know, so here's this, here's an exam, oop, go back, go back. Here's an exam question. Now, I wouldn't write this code, right, I wouldn't write this code this way. I would put a parenthesis here and a parenthesis there. Be it's the same thing, because that's exactly, the 2 times 3 is going to happen, and the 4 over 5 is going to happen, and then the plus and the minus will happen left to right. But why not make it easier on your readers and just put the parentheses in because they're redundant. They're not necessary, but away you go. Now, if you don't want it to happen in that order, of course, then you have to put parentheses. If you want the addition to happen before the multiplication, then you have to put parentheses in, which you can. But we tend to recommend that you use more parentheses rather than less parentheses. Now, Python integer division in Python 2, which we are using Python 2 for this class. There's a new Python 3 that the world is slowly transitioning to, and a lot of people are using it in teaching, um, but it's not as common sort of in the real world with libraries and utilities. And so we'll stick with Python 2 for a few more years until Python 3 uh, really kind of turns the corner. Um, it's nice to have it there, but there's so much Python, and it's so popular, Python 2 that it's uh, just kind of hard to get everybody up to Python 3. So in Python 2, integer division truncates. And you saw that before, um, where I did the 5,280 by 1,000, and I got 5 as it. And, but we can look at a couple of examples that make this really very quite, quite clear. So 10 divided by 2 is 5, as you would expect. 9 divided by 2 is 4. Not exactly what you'd expect. You kind of expect that to be 4.5 instead of 4. But in Python 3, it will be 4.5. But for now, in Python 2, 9 over, 9 over 2 is 4. And um, 99 over 100 is 0. Now, that seems rather counterintuitive, but it is a truncating division. It's not a rounding division. It's a truncating division. Now, interestingly, if you make either of these numbers have a decimal, make them what we call floating point numbers, um, then the division is done in floating point. So 10.0 over 2.0 is 5.0. Now, these are different. This is an integer number, and this is a floating point number. It's 5.0. And then 99.0 over 100.0 is exactly as you would expect, and it's a floating point number. So Now, you can also mix integers and floating point numbers as you go. So here we have 99 over 100. Those are both integers, integer, integer. And, or, and that comes out with zero because it's truncating. Now, if we have an integer and a floating point number, 99 over 100.0, then that comes out as 0 0.99. And either one, if we have 99 over 100, that's a floating point, and that's an integer, we still end up with a floating point. So this is a floating point, floating point. 
and even in complex expressions as it evaluates when it sees an integer. So the first thing it would evaluate is this would become a 6. So it would be 1 plus 6 over 4.0 minus 5. Then it would be doing this 6 over 4.0 and that would be 1.5. 1 plus 1.5 minus 5. And so this is an integer and that's a floating point and the result becomes a floating point. And then the rest of the calculation is done floating point to the point where the ultimate is a floating point negative 2.5. So you can throw a floating point into a calculation and as soon as the calculation touches the floating point, the remainder of the calculation is done in floating point. It kind of converts it to floating point, but it doesn't want to convert it back because it considers floating point sort of the more general of the representations. Here we are talking about integers and floating points. These are a concept in programming languages and in Python called type. Variables and constants have a type. We can see that if you say 1 versus 1.0, they have different, they, it works different, it functions differently. And so Python keeps track of both variables and literal slash constants and having them have a type. And we've seen this, right? Now the interesting thing is, is Python is very aware of the type and can use the same syntax to accomplish different things. So if we look at this line here where we say dd equals 1.4, well it looks at the 1 and looks at the 4 and says, oh, those are two integers. I will add those together and give you a 5. So it gives you an integer, an integer, and an integer comes back. Okay, And then ee equals hello plus there. Well, these are two strings, hello and there. And it says, hmm, this must be a concatenation. Right? So I'm going to concatenate those together because those are strings, and I know how to concatenate strings, and that's kind of like string addition, right? And so we see a hello there as a result. Now, the interesting thing is where did this space come from? Let me change colors here. Where, oops. Where did that space come from? Well, the plus does not add the space. There's a space right there, and that's the space. So I concatenated hello space plus there, and that's how I got hello there. But the key thing is, is this plus operator, clear. This plus operator looks to either side and says, oh, they're strings. I think you mean concatenation. Here, it looks either side and says, oh, those are integers. I think you mean addition. So Python is very aware of type, and type informs Python what you really mean. And so it looks like those are kind of the same, but they're quite different operations. So the type can get you in trouble. Remember, Python is looking at the type. So here we have a little problem, our first traceback, first of many tracebacks. So here we have uh, EE, which is hello there, which is exactly what we did. This is a string, and this is a string. So EE should be a string. And then we try to add 1 to it. And again, Python is saying, oh, I see an, a plus sign here. So I'm look over here, yeah, that's a string, and we'll look over here, and that's an integer. It's like, ah, and this is a traceback. Now, here's a good time to talk about tracebacks. Tracebacks, I color them red, because you might think that Python dislikes you or thinks that you're, you know, unworthy of its brilliance. And certainly the way these things are worded, it sounds like, you know, the, you're being scolded. It's like, hey. Type error. You can cannot concatenate stir and int objects, right? That's I'm, I'm scolding you. You're bad, bad programmer. And it does feel a bit like you're scolded. But if you go back to lecture one, this is also the moment where really we shouldn't think of this as like scolding. We should think of this as Python sort of asking for help. It's like, wow, you gave me this line, and I, Python, have no idea. In all your greatness, could you give me some possible clue as to what you really mean for me to do because I'm so lost. And given that I'm Python and I'm lost and you are the only purpose for my existence, uh, I must stop until you give me better guidance. So don't look at tracebacks as scolding. They sound like scolding. I'll stop coloring them red after a while. So if Python is so obsessed with the type of things, you should be able to ask Python what the type of something is. And so there's a built-in function called type. This is part of the Python language, type parenthesis, and you can put a variable in here. What's the type of the variable ee? And it says, oh, yeah, I know what that is. That would be a string. 
And then you can also put a constant in here and say, what's the type of quote, hello, quote? And that's a string, too. And what's the type of the number 1? Well, that would be an integer. So it's picky about the type, but it'll also share with you what it believes the type is. And there's several types of numbers. As I've already mentioned, there are integers, which are the whole numbers. They can be positive and negative and 0. And then there are the decimal numbers, the floating point numbers, like 98.6 or negative 2.5 or 14.0. Python knows these as well because it does division different if it's presented with two integers or an integer and a float or a float and a float. And so here we have x is 1 and we say what is it? It's an integer and we say it's 98.6 and we say well what's that? It's a float and you can ask for both variables and constants so what's the type of 1? It's an integer and what's the type of 1.0? and it's a float. You can also convert types. It has a bunch of type conversion functions built into it. So there's an implicit conversion going on when you're sort of saying, you know, divide an integer by a floating point. It says, okay, I see, I look to the sides and I will make the, con I will make the conversion for you. But you can also be explicit. So in this case, we're going to say, take this 99 and convert it to a floating point version of itself, which is 99.0 and then do the division. So Python looks out here and goes, oh, after that, that's a float, and that's an integer if I look over here, and then that means that the result is a float, and the division is done as a float. So we are force converting the 99 integer into a 99.0 float. And we can even do this like and just stick it in a variable. So we can put 42 in i, and that is an integer. Then we can say, hey, convert float that i into a float and stick it into the variable f. And so we can print it. And now it's 42.0 instead of 42. Right? They're not the same. They're both kind of 42, but one is a floating point 42 and the other is an integer 42. And we can ask and that is a float. And you can also do the same thing in the middle of a calculation where you have 1 plus 2 times float of 3. This float is done quickly. So the first thing that happens, this is 1 plus 2 times 3.0, over 4, minus 5. So the first thing that happens is these floats are done, because they're parentheses, so they matter. So this is a built-in function called float that takes, as its argument, a non-floating point number and gives you back a floating point number. We'll talk more about functions in Chapter 4. You can also convert between strings and numbers. And, uh, and if you recall, I, we did the example where we tick a string. In this case, I'm being a little confusing because I'm making a string with the characters 1, 2, 3. Now, this is not the same as 123. This is a three-character string with 1, 2, 3 in it. And I can ask what kind of thing is in there, and it says, oh, there's a string in there. I know about that. And then I can try to add 1 to it. And it seems intuitive that quote 1, 2, 3 plus 1 would be somehow 124. But it's not. Python takes a look at the plus and says, oh, there's a string on that side and an integer on that side. I am going to freak out and tell you that you cannot concatenate a string and an integer. Okay? But there is an int function that converts various things, including strings, to an integer. So we can give as its parameter its input the string value, then it converts it to an integer, and then we'll put the result in the variable iVal. We can ask what the type of that is. It's an i, it's a integer, and now we can use it in an expression, print iVal plus 1, and so now Python looks to both sides, sees an integer, sees an integer, and gets 124. Voila. Now, if I make a new variable and I stick hello Bob in it, and I say, hey, let's convert hello Bob to an integer, as you might expect, it blows up. And it says invalid literal for int. These, these tracebacks, again, once you kind of get used to the kind of harsh wording of them, because they're not saying, sorry, comma, they're trying to tell you what's going on. So cannot concatenate string and integer, and invalid literal for int. It's trying to be as helpful as it possibly can be to give you a clue as to what to fix. So. Again, not scolding. Okay, so that's variables and types and type conversion. Now we'll talk a little bit about user input. 
and uh, there's a function that's built into Python called raw input and what happens when raw input runs is it it has as one of its parameters a prompt which is something that shows up on the screen who are you and then it waits sits and waits it says what next and then you type a string da, 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 and then you hit the enter key the enter key and then whatever you typed here goes into a variable and it is a string and then you then you can use it so I'm gonna print the string welcome comma so that means I'm printing two things now the comma adds a space between welcome and then nam and so welcome is a literal and then Chuck is coming from this nam variable so this is a two-line program and I think this is one of your assignments actually to uh, well it's one of the exercises in the book to uh, prompt for a user's name and then welcome them okay so raw input is a function that issues a prompt waits and then takes whatever string that's entered and then returns it and then puts it into that variable so now we're going to create kind of the first useful program. It's not a powerful program. It is a an interesting problem of uh, the fact that for some reason um, there's a difference in the numbering scheme of United States elevators and European elevators. Uh, European elevators, uh, the floor that you walk out on is the zero floor. The floor above that is the one floor and the floor below that, the basement, is the minus one floor. And so you walk in and you can either go up the elevator or down the elevator. Of course, in the United States, the floor that you walk in is the one, and then there's the two floor above that, and then there's like the basement. So this is the, this is the imagination that the Americans have as to how to number floors. Right? The Europeans go zero, one, minus one. So children who go to hotels learn instantly the notion of zero and the notion of positive and negative numbers and the symmetry between positive and negative numbers. I mean, I just wish the United States hotels would switch to this to teach young people zero immediately and negative numbers. So we somehow think that numbers all in the United States start at one and then there are no no negative numbers, there's the basement. I wonder why that is, but whatever. For people who travel a lot, they may be confused by this. They need a way to convert back and forth between the U.S. and European numbering system. So this is a simple program that demonstrates a real classic pattern of input processing and output. It's just three lines, but it has the essential things that all programs that are useful, they generally read some data, do some work with the data and then produce some kind of results. And so so the first line is a raw input that effectively that puts out a prompt and then it waits. It says please enter your Europe floor. It sits there. We type a zero. Then zero goes into imp, but it is a string. It's not a number. It is a string. So we can't add to it. But we can take and convert it to an integer with the int function, int of imp. That's a string being converted to an integer, so now it's a real numeric zero, and we can add one to that, and we sum that together, and we put it in to the variable usf, and then we print us floor comma, and then whatever the variable for usf is, and out comes us floor one. So we've written a very simple elevator floor conversion from a European floor to the United States floor. Don't ask about negative numbers. It's not really good at that. But from zero and positive numbers, it works great. So another thing to uh, think about in any programming language is comments. Comments are like commentary. Come, you know, and 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 basically, it's a way for us to uh, add notations for ourselves or for other humans interspersed in the code. And so in Python, anything after a pound sign is ignored. 
You can have a pound sign at the beginning of the line and then the whole line is ignored. There are two or three reasons why you can do this. One is sort of like paragraph headings where you can say what's going to happen in English um, or, or your language. And you can write documentation that says this code was written by Charles Severance, December 2010. Um, and you can also just hide a line of code to test and, and turn it on and off without actually deleting the line of code. It's a real common thing in, in debugging. So, for example, here is a here is a the program that we've been playing with. This is our word counting program that we've been talking about from the beginning. And here is an example of four comments: one, two, three, four. Four comments that basically tell us what these paragraphs are going to do. Now, they don't have any effect on the program whatsoever. But this one says, "Get the name of the file and open it." Kind of helpful, right? Count the word frequency. That's what this little bit does. Find the most common word. That's what this little bit does. And all done, print this out. So it's really can be very helpful just to add a little tiny bit of stuff. You don't want to overuse comments. You don't want to say like x equals 12. Take 12 and put it into x. Sometimes people teach you and try to say, oh, you need a one comment every three lines. I don't believe in any of those rules. I basically say if it's useful to describe it, then describe it. So that's comments. So uh, <clears throat> some operators apply to strings. We've already talked about plus. It's kind of silly, although useful in places. You can actually multiply strings. Where this is the, the asterisk looks and says, I got a string and an integer. And it prints out the string five times. Not a lot of use for that. Now, let's talk a little bit about choosing variable names. This is something that is really confusing. So I said like x equals 1, x equals x plus 1. What does x mean? And the answer is, it doesn't mean anything. I chose it. I wanted to make a variable, and so I picked x. We pick x a lot, probably because we learned in algebra in sixth grade that x was a variable. So, and it's short, and so why not call it x? But as your programs get larger, this gets kind of frustrating to have all your variables like x and y and z. And so the notion of mnemonic, it means memory aid, we choose our variable names wisely so they remind us of what the variable's going to do internally. And so it, as I go through this lecture, in the beginning, if I choose a variable that's so, too clever, you're going to think that it's part of the language. And so I sort of switch back and forth between well-chosen variable names and stupid variable names to kind of re-emphasize the notion that I can choose. Mnemonic is a good practice. Okay, so here we go. Let's take a look at a bit of code. So the question is, what is this code doing? What will it even print out? Is it syntactically correct? Now you could probably cut and paste this in to your brow into Python and figure out that it is syntactically correct. There are three variables. This one here and this one here match. This one here and that one there match. And these two match. So it's taking these two numbers and multiplying together and then printing out the product of the two numbers. If you're real careful and like look at every very every character. Now, this would be called non-mnemonic variables. They're really messy. Now, Python, it's happy because all it wants is to say, "Oh, here's the name that I the programmer decided I wanted to call this piece of memory and I'll refer to it down here." Okay? And so Python's happy. Now, if you hand this to another human being, they're going to be really unhappy because they're going to be like, what are you doing? So one better way to write it would be to make the variables very simple. And then cognitively, we humans can figure out which is which. Because again, it's still only about matching. The A has to match the A, the B matches the B, and the C's match. It's actually the exact same program. A equals 35, B equals 12.5, C equals A times B, and print C. It is these, Python sees these as the same program. It doesn't care what we name them. Now a human will be much appreciative 
if you say here you can either have this one or this one this one will make them a lot happier Woo. okay so that is certainly cognitively easier but it's not really giving you any sense of what's going on here right so an even better way to write this exact same program to do the exact same thing would be to choose variables named hours rate and pay if indeed that is what you're doing now you can look at this and you go oh well shoot 35 is the number of hours and 12 and a half is the rate and the pay is the number of hours times the rate and then we're gonna print out the pay that makes a lot of sense so this is really a awesome and wonderful characterization and this, if that's what you're doing, and if those are hours, rate, and pay, it's a great thing to name your variables. But this is where beginning students get confused. And so sometimes I'll write it this way, and sometimes I'll write it this way. Because you look at this until you get a little more sophisticated, a little more skilled, and you say, like, does Python know something about payroll? Is hours a reserved word? Is rate a reserved word and pay a reserved word? Are these things that Python knows about? And the answer is no. Python sees these three programs as exactly the same name. It's just this person really made a very bad choice of a variable name. This person made a less bad choice of a variable name. And this person made a really awesome choice of a variable name. So the only difference between these two things is style. They are the exact same program. And Python is equivalently happy with these. But humans are most happy when the variables are easy to remember and they are somewhat descriptive of what their expected contents will be. That's mnemonic to help you remember what you were meaning to do when you write the program. This is still a bit cryptic. Having these really short one character variable names is still a bit cryptic. So you have a couple of uh, assignments at the end of the chapter. One of the assignments is to write a program to prompt the user for hours and rate per hour and compute pay. So I won't do this here, but just a couple of sort of uh, things. Um, you want to be using raw input. But remember that hands a string in. So you're going to have to use float, the function to convert it to a floating point number so you can actually do a calculation. And then you're going to have to use multiplication and print. So multiplication and then print. So it's some combination of raw input, float, multiplication, and print constructed to, to make your program do exactly this. So this is the end of uh, chapter two. We talked about types, reserved words, variables, the mnemonic, how you choose variable names. We'll hit this a couple more times because choosing variable names is always problematic. Operators, operator precedence, which just means like does multiplication happen before plus, parentheses. Integer division is a little weird because it truncates, whoop, truncates, right? 9 over 10, whoop, 9 over 10 equals 0. That's the integer division truncating. Conversion, this is like the int float. And then user input, which is raw input, and then comments, which are ways for you to add human readable text to your program. Okay? See you next lecture. Hello, and welcome to Chapter 3 of Python for Informatics. Chapter 1, Chapter 2, now we're going to get to something kind of programming. I mean, assignment statements and reserved words, that's just kind of gurgling. Now we're going to start seeing composition. We're going to start seeing the conditional execution uh, gets us started sort of seeing the power of computers where you're starting to make decisions. So as always, this lecture and uh, audio, video, and slides are also available are copyright creative commons attribution. So um, conditional steps are steps that may or may not be executed. So here's here's a bit of code. So and and. I draw these pictures. I, I won't draw too many of these pictures on the left-hand side. If you've taken a programming class, you may have seen these. They're sometimes called flowcharts. Uh, sometimes people really think these are important. I, I don't think they're all that important for understanding. I, the, the Python code is here on the right-hand side, and this picture's on the left-hand side. And, and the reality is, is that this may 
initially make more sense cognitively to you than this. But this part on the right hand side is what's important. I like to call these like road maps so you can sort of trace where the code is going by driving down a little road. Um, that's kind of a something that you do once or twice and then pretty soon you just start reading the code. So I'm going to start on the right hand side here and just walk through the code. Remember code operates in sequence. Well, there is a if which is a special reserved word. It's one of those things that you can't you can't name a variable if and it is our indication that uh, to Python that the uh, next statement that we're going to do may or may not be executed if and the thing that comes on the same line as the if up to including the, the little colon the, is a question this is a question you're asking a question so an assignment statement is moving a value into a variable and a if statement is asking a question in this case we're asking a question about a variable so always think when you're sort of here that this is a question to be asked and you'll notice when I'm doing the same thing over here I put a question mark there is X less than 10 yes or no it's a question that has a yes or no and so the way this works is this statement that's indented after the if is either executed or not executed based on the result of that question so the way to sort of read this in English is set X to 5 if X is less than 10 which it is because x is 5, then we're going to execute this. So print smaller comes out, and then we come back out and we continue and say, oh, okay, now I have another if statement, and then a bit of a block of indented code. If x is less than 20, that's the question. The answer to that is no, and so it does not run that line, and so it runs fini. So the printout of this program is smaller, followed by fini. What happens is this line never executes because the answer to this question is false. Okay, so let's go through that a little faster. Set x to 5. If x is less than 10, print smaller. Then if x is greater than 20, which it's not, skip that and then print fini. That's the short version of it. Okay, conditional steps. This step is conditional, this step is conditional. They may or may not be executed based on the result of the question. Now, if we're thinking of this as like a GPS roadmap or something, we can look at this right-hand side. So the, com the CPU comes roaring down here, x equals 5, okay, I'll run that. Then it's faced with a choice. Do Is x less than 10? Yes or no? If it is yes, and it is, I will go this way. If it was no, I would go that way. So if it's yes, I go here and I run this little thing, and print smaller, great, and I follow the little road, and now the road takes me to here. And it's asking another question is x greater than 20. This time the answer is no, so I'd come down here. right? And so this bit of code is never executed. Now, this is a very simple example, but you get the basic idea. Okay, so that's conditional execution. Now there's a number of conditional operators that we want to use, just like we had multiplication, division. Um, some of them are, are uh, pretty, uh, pretty intuitive, and the others you just kind of have to memorize. Uh, like less than and greater than make a lot of sense. Um, the one that probably the easy like less than or equal to or greater than or equal to those kind of make sense too. They're less than or equal to um, just because we don't have a less than or equal to sign on a symbol or a greater than or equal sign which we would use in mathematics. Um, equality asking the question of whether something is equal to something else or not is double equal. And that's because we're already using single equals as assignment. So when we say x equals 3, that is an assignment and sticks a value into x. This is the question. Is x equal to? If I was building a language, I would make it be equal question mark or something like that. I'd be like, huh? Is it equal? Kind of a question mark. But that's not what we do. I didn't invent this, so we are double equals is the question. Is something equal to another? A single equals changes something. X equals 5 changes X. Okay, and then not equal, exclamation is commonly used to mean not in computer context. So if something is not equal to something, it is exclamation equal. Here are some examples. Just kind of running through them. Uh, they're all, they all turn out to be true because I said X to 5. If X equals 5, print equals 5. Come out here, if x is greater than 4, which is true, print greater than 4. If x greater than or equal to 5, yeah. If x less than 6, 
print less than six. Now here's a, there are two sort of syntaxes to, to the if statement. One is where the if statement is down here on a separate line and it's indented. And the other is where there's a single line and it's right on the same line. If x less than six, print less than six. So this is true, so this whole thing executes. Then it continues down. If x less than or equal to five, yeah, print less than or equal to five. If x is not equal to six, which is true because it's five, then not equal to six. So all those will turn out to be true and all those will execute. And so the the tricky bit here is, you know, just knowing, seeing this syntax for an if statement where it's all one line and this syntax where you end the first line with a colon and then indent the second line. This you can only do one line. We will soon see that you can put more than one line in an indented block. Okay. Here we have more than one in line in the indented block. These are called one-way decisions. And so we say x equals 5. We print out before 5, so that prints out. If x equals 5, remember the double equals is the question mark version of equality. Single equals assignment. It says yes. So we indent, and the convention is to indent four spaces, although it doesn't really matter as long as you're consistent. Then it's going to run all three of those. Is 5, still 5, third 5. These lines all come out. And then it comes out and prints... And the de-indenting, the fact that this print has been moved to line up with the if, that's what indicates that this little block of conditional executed code is, uh, is finished. So then it prints out afterwards 5, some more, before 6. Then it asks another question, if x is equal to 6. Again, that's the question mark version of it. And if this is false now, because x happens to be 5, so the answer to this expression, the logical expression, is false. Then it skips all of the indented bits, so none of this executes. So since it's false, it skips all of the indented bit, but then it, this print lines up, and so then it picks back up with afterwards 6. So we call this a one-way decision where you have the question, and then you have a couple of things that you're going to do on this true, true thing, or if it turns out that you're false, you're going to skip all those things. So Python uh, is actually one of the few languages that uses indentation as syntactically significant. Uh, we like to indent code to, for ifs, and in a moment we'll see you learn about loops. We like to indent code as a way to make sense of stuff. It makes it easier to read um, you know, if this thing's inside. And so it, it's really quite nice. And then we sort of use it as a matching to help us cognitively understand what's inside of, uh, of a program. But in Python, it's really, really important. And it's almost, it's, it's, you have to think of like, when you are moving in, you mean something, and when you move back out, you mean something. So you can increase the indent, which you do after like an if statement or any other statement that ends in a colon. You increase the indent, and then when you're done, you decrease the indent. You maintain the indent sort of for sequential code. Now, blank lines and comments are ignored. So you can have a blank line and it, it, the indentation just goes right past it and the comments don't affect it. And so while we're here, we'll interrupt us for a, uh, a, a recommendation. In your text editor, Notepad Plus or TextEdit or Text Wrangler or whatever you're using, um, it may be set when you hit the tab key to move in four spaces. Sometimes you also might move in four spaces by hitting spacebar four times. Python will see that as different. And it is possible in all of these word processors to say, hey, don't actually put tabs in my document. When I hit the tab, put in four spaces. Then whether you're hitting the spacebar or hitting the tab, at least you are putting the same thing into your document and, don't, and not freaking Python out. If you don't, you may get indentation errors. Indentation errors are syntax errors to Python. And what's really frustrating is if you it looks good to you in your text editor, you have an if and the block goes in and it comes back out, but one of them is four spaces and one of them is a tab, then Python will yell at you. And this is really frustrating when Python yells at you about that. So what I'd like you to do is go into your text editor, whatever it is, uh, <clears throat> into the properties or the settings and here is you know your yours may be different but here is where you set this auto expand tabs that is on the Mac in uh, text wrangler 
and then in Notepad++ there is Replace Tabs of Spaces, and that's underneath Preferences, so you have to find it. Stop right now and go set this so you're not going to make yourself crazy. Okay, so this is kind of a busy slide, but it gives you this sense that you have to explicitly think about indenting and de-indenting. Okay, and so I'm just going to walk through this. So when you have two lines lining up, that means they're going to run sequentially. If you see an if, or later here we'll see a for, we haven't talked about for yet, but it's, it's like if. So the fact that we go from this second line to this third line and move the indent in, we're actually creating a block that has to do with this if. And it, you can always kind of tell these, the if and the for end in a colon character. Now, we could pull this print back out, but we want it to be part of the if, so we maintain the indent. And then we're done with the if by pulling out. So we line the P with the I, and that means this is outside of the if. This for, which we haven't learned about for yet, for is another statement that ends in colon, and afterwards you have to indent. Then you maintain the indent. Here's an if, but now we have an if, and we're already in, but that ends in a colon, so we go in farther. And now this is the block. Now we come back out, and we line up with that if right there. Okay. And now at the end of this, this indent, this X here, comes all the way back out, so it lines up. The rest of these are kind of weird in that comments don't matter, blank lines don't matter, and so it just is sort of, you have to get mentally get used to the notion that these don't count. They can really cognitively mess you up, so these don't count. And now if I look through it without with the comments hidden, it starts in column one, Ignore, ignore, goes in, stays in, ignore, 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 comes out. So that's, it all makes sense. Those comments and blank lines are just kind of confusion. So, increasing and decreasing indent has meaning in Python. We'll learn more about this in a bit. Our programs won't get this complex right away, but it's important to think these indents aren't just pretty, they actually are communicating something to Python. And what they're communicating is basically what's in a block. And it shouldn't take you very long when you start looking at Python to sort of visualize these blocks. So here, there, here's a big block, this block here that's got these three things. And then this is a block as well. And you can kind of say, well, here's an if statement. And then these are the two statements that are part of that if statement. So mentally, you kind of make these block pictures. So here's another block. This is that for loop. This part's the indented part, but then there's a block inside of the block. So you've got to kind of start seeing that as well. So this is a block that has to do, this green block is the, the one that has to do with, uh, with the if. And then there's a block here, and then this is a great big block because this is where it finally de-indents. So don't worry about it yet, but at some point you're just going to start seeing this indenting and de-indenting as defining blocks of code. Uh, for various purposes. Now we don't have all the purposes yet, but we'll get there. Hello, and welcome to Chapter 4, Functions, in my book, Python for Informatics. As always, these slides and this audio and this video are copyright Creative Commons attribution. Now we are to the point, you know, Chapter 4, we're sort of well into the class, so I figure I should introduce myself a little bit, let you know a little bit. Um, as I said before, uh, I think in the beginning, uh, we're taking, I'm taping this in a wonderful building at the University of Michigan called uh, North Quad. It's a relatively new building. It's uh, got uh, some residential sections and some academic sections and some classrooms. And one of the classrooms that I typically teach in is uh, uh, actually 2255 North Quad. It's a really beautiful room with great ways for people to interact. And so sometimes I'm teaching, you know, little tiny Dr. Chuck down here with a smile on the face. Um, and sometimes my students are taking me on, uh, taking my classes on campus, and sometimes students are watching me through a uh, lecture. Um, and so this building, building is really beautiful, and if you ever get a chance to come to Ann Arbor and take a look at it, maybe walk through it, it's really, it's really quite nice. One of the things I like about it is that I think it's really... Uh, highly inspired by Harry Potter. 
the kind of, of course, Oxford and Cambridge are the real inspiration for Harry Potter, but our our cafeteria, for example, it kind of looks like the four tables in Hogwarts, and you can kind of imagine a snowy owl flying around and a uh, sorting hat at the at the front sorting people. And so uh, the nickname the nickname for the place is Quad Warts because it's North Quad Quad Warts. That's like Hogwarts and North Quad kind of jammed together. And of course, given that we sort of think of ourselves a little bit as Harry Potter, uh, people, when they first come in the September, uh, often sort of decide to sort themselves. And uh, a few years back, when the, we first started the building, uh, the students decided that I did not get to be in Gryffindor. As a matter of fact, it's probably time for me to, to show you who I am and who I've been sorted to be. So the students decided that I couldn't be in Gryffindor, that I had to be in Slytherin. And that's because of my name, Charles Severance, and Severus Snape. What's even cooler, of course, is given that I teach Python, Slytherin's house is a snake, right? So, makes a lot of sense. I even have this really fancy Slytherin teacup that I use to drink tea during lectures. Sometimes I drink coffee, sometimes I drink tea. Oh, wow, this thing itches, so let me just get rid of it. If I had any hair, that would mess my hair up. So let me get rid of this for the rest of the lecture. Uh, so there I am. Okay. None of that. Back to, back to Dr. Chuck. So, with that sort of brief, brief interlude, the, um, the topic of the actual topic of this lecture is functions. And so storing and reusing is basically an idea that we will often have a series of steps that we will want to use over and over in a program, increasingly complex. Um, the things we'll use in this lecture are kind of silly um, because I have to keep them short so the slides don't get too long. But a good example of you know the kind of work is um, maybe I'm going to use uh, Google's geocoding service and I'm going to send some unstructured data back and get a a GPS coordinate back, and that's a service that I want to call, and it would maybe be about this much lines of this many lines of code, and I'm going to want to do that all over the place. So, that, do I want to put this many lines of code 40 places in my program, or do I want to put it one place and then call it in the various places that I need it? And so that's why I call it the store and the reuse function. So, if we take a look at the simple syntax here. Um, these things are called functions, and some languages are called subprograms, but we call them functions in <clears throat> in Python. And the keyword that we're really going to focus on is def, which stands for define. And uh, what happens here is it, when Python sees this def keyword, it actually doesn't run the code. It says, "Oh, you're going to make a function, and you're going to kind of turn on a recorder and start recording this code." So it has a colon at the end of it, so it has an indented block afterwards. And so the indented block becomes recorded. So instead of running the code, like if, if we just put print hello and print fun, it would run it. But instead it says, hey, don't run it right now. Name it hello. We give it a name. It's kind of like a variable. We choose the name. We've chosen hello as the name of this. Define it as hello. Have it have these two lines of Python in it. And we'll use it later. Okay, and so that's the function definition. That's the store phase. That is, it's sort of like it doesn't really run those lines. It sort of makes a variable called hello that actually contains Python code rather than containing like 12 or a string or something like that that we've worked with before. So this is the store part, and then the reuse part is we then have extended Python. We now can call our bit of code. So we say hello. Hello name is what we came up with, parenthesis. And then that says, remember that code that I put in there under the name hello? Run it now. And so, so, so if I start looking at that, and then it just continues. So let me kind of clear this and start over again. And so if I watch what Python does from the beginning, is it reads here and goes, oh, you're defining a function named hello. Great. I will sort of remember, remember. I got that remembered for you. Let's continue on. Oh, hello. 
you want me to run that stuff that you just got done storing under the name hello. So then it kind of goes and runs it, and out comes hello fun. Then after that, it runs to this print, and then out comes print zip. Then we say, you know what, I want to reuse that again. I stored it once, I can reuse it as many times as I want, and now hello, and then these two lines of code run a second time. So we stored them once, gave them a name, and then ran them twice in the context of wherever it is we wanted. Now, this is not sort of a profound, uh, a profound reason to use it in this. I'm just trying to give you the notion that there is a way to store and name code that then you can retrieve later. That's really what's going on here. So there's two kind of functions inside of Python, and we've actually been using them almost from the very first lecture. And that is, there are built-in functions that Python provides to us, like float, raw input, int, those kinds of functions. Those are just part of Python, but we call them as functions. The difference is we don't write them. And then there's user-defined functions, functions that we write, functions that create functionality that we want them to make use of, like encapsulating the ability to compute pay for time and a half for overtime. And so we name these things and we treat them as new reserved words that we've created. They're kind of an extension to the language, as it were. So when we're coming along, we define a function with the def keyword, right? The def keyword is a reserved word. It's one of the many reserved words back in chapter one that we talked about. And it indicates to Python the beginning of a function. We define it, and then when we call it, it's called invoking. It's like we're building it, and then we're invoking it. And you can build it once, and then invoke it many, many times. So, for example, here is a built-in function called max that finds the largest character, the sort of lexicographically largest character in a string. And so it's like, okay, tell me the maximum character. And so max is not some code that we've written, but we are invoking a function here. And we're passing in an argument to that. So the argument is the stuff in between the parentheses. So the max function can find the maximum of many different things. At this moment, we want it to find the maximum of that particular string, the highest character in that particular string. So this is a, a right-hand side of an assignment statement, too. So that has to be evaluated to a value. So it goes into the function, does whatever things the function wants to do, and then the function gives us back a value that becomes the value for max parenthesis hello world. And that value in this case is the letter W, okay? because the letter W is decided to be the highest letter, and that's what max gives us back. And then we're done, when we're done with that, then that W ends up being assigned, the assignment statement completes. And so you can think of the function evaluation as happening as part of the right-hand side expression calculation. There could be a plus here and other stuff, and it's just at some point a big expression. In this one, it's a simple expression with just one function call. Now, if we look at this, there's some code somewhere. Somebody wrote some code. It's part of Python. You didn't write it. There's a max function somewhere, and you can think of a function as having some input. It's kind of like a program. That's why some languages call these things subprograms, because they have an input, they do some kind of useful works, whatever that useful work happens to be, and then they produce some kind of an output, right? So hello world is the input, the string, the arguments, the thing we're passing in. Hello world is what's being passed in to the function. The function is running, and then something comes back and is sent back. So it has input, processing, and output. Input, processing, and output. So that's how a function, some stored code, whether we wrote it or not, they, they work the same when we call functions. Right? So you could think of this as somewhere inside of the Python library is some code that maybe has a little def in there, and the name they named the function max, and it takes a single parameter, and it does some blah, 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 loopy, blah, 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 blah stuff, whatever max wants to do whatever we need Max to do based on the specifications that Max is supposed to support. But somewhere there is code inside of Python that actually represents the function definition. It's a built-in function because it comes with Python and we didn't have to do anything to add it. So some common built-in functions that we have been using all along. Uh, 
Good examples are the float, which takes as input anything and returns you a float tape floating point numbered version floating point number version of that. Type, which takes a parameter of a variable or a constant and says, what is the type of this? Float, again converting. Type, again, and float. So these are all things that we've been calling functions all along. And it passes the input value into the function. The function runs and then gives us back a return value, which then participates in the rest of the expression on the right-hand side. You can think of it as pausing the calculation on the right hand side, calling the function, getting the result of the function back, and then continuing the evaluation of the right hand side, then coming up with whatever value, and then printing that value out. Okay? Another thing <clears throat> that we've done is we've done string conversions, right? So we've converted, in this case, a string to an integer, and asked what type it is. We've converted a string to an integer, so int converts its argument, whatever that happens to be, into an integer. So that's just some of the built-in functions that we have talked about so far. Now, this becomes more interesting when we can make our own, own functions. Oops, there goes my T bag right in the middle of the thing. We only take the T bag out. I think it's, whoa, hang on, be right back. bag. Okay, there's my T. So, so we want to make a new function. Like I said, in the other example, we use the def keyword. The def keyword here, and then we have some indented bit. We create a name for it and then have some parentheses. These parentheses will later tell the inputs that we're going to pass in, but this function has no input, so we just go parenthesis, parenthesis, and then the all-important colon character, which indicates the beginning of an indented block of Python that then is the, the text of the function. So it's important to remember that while this is executing, when Python first looks at this, it doesn't run these lines of code. It just remembers them and names them print lyrics. So it doesn't cause any printout. It just causes Python to remember it. I've probably said that a few too many times. So, so here is a difficult problem, um, and I'll, I'll let you think about it for a while. I want you to kind of mentally go through and execute this code, and ask what, ask yourself, what the output of this program would produce. How many lines? How many lines of output would this program produce? So, how many of you said three? How many of you said five? Well, the right answer is actually three. You see five print statements, two, three, four, five. But two of the print statements are sitting inside of this. And we never called, we never invoked the function down here. Okay? So, this one, let's clear this, this one prints, these two get skipped, this one prints, and this one prints. So that's why there are three statements that print. There is, stored, but we never used, a function called print lyrics, and it's got two statements in it, but we never used it. So the output of this is, hello, yo, seven. And that's because we never actually invoked it. We had to say print lyrics parenthesis or whatever to cause it to call this. Okay, that's just to emphasize that as it looks at it, it does not execute these lines. So once we defined a function, once we have given it a name, given it code that is a part of it, then we can invoke it or call it as many times as we like. So now our little example works a little better if we actually call our function. Python really doesn't care if you don't call your function. It's like, I, you told me to make one, I made one, you didn't use it, there you go. But if you look at this one now, so here we go, x equals 5, print hello, out comes hello, define, nothing happens here, nothing happens here, it's just remembering, okay, then it says print yo, then it calls the function print lyrics, which sort of stops us here, runs these two lines of code, 
So out comes that and that. Then it sort of finishes this and it comes back. x equals x plus 2. Then it prints x. Uh, that must mean x is 7. And so out that comes. And so, so, so again, uh, it, it's on the first time through. Oh, go back, go back, go back. On the first time through, it doesn't print. But then when it hits this, it prints. You could say the print lyrics several more times and it would run this as many times as it did and that it needed to as many times as you want and it would make output for you. So you can invoke, this is the definition, let's clear this, this is the definition, this is the call or invoke. So we're in, invoking the function, we're calling the function, we're causing the function to execute. Here we are just causing the function to be looked at and defined, but not actually executed. Hope that's clear. Now, when we pass data into a function, and, and, and functions that don't take data are, are not as useful as they could be. There's plenty of things that do, uh, times that you build a function that doesn't take data. But the most interesting functions are the ones that you can hand them something to work on, and they can do their work, and then come back with uh, whatever. So this max function is a good example of this, one that's taking an argument. We call the things in between the parentheses when we're invoking the function, we call the things in between the parentheses arguments. Okay, So that's passing into the function, feeding data into the, into the function. So we put arguments in between them. So for example, here we have a little program that, uh, that is, it's a function named greet. And now we are going to define this function and we're going to say, you know what, I would like to take a parameter. Let's take a parameter. Let's have one parameter come in. And we need kind of a placeholder for that parameter. So within the function, we're going to use lang. Now, this isn't actually a real variable. It's kind of like a, it's a placeholder variable. So this first parameter, whatever it is, when it's called, is going to be lang. And so if that first parameter is equal to es, we're going to print hola. And if it, else, if it's equal to fr, we'll print bonjour. And otherwise, we'll print hello. So there's apparently three languages in the world, uh, Spanish, French, and English. And if it's not Spanish or French, then it must be English. But I have to keep this kind of small so my screen doesn't get too big. So this is, again, just the definition. And if you type this into the interactive thing, it gives you this dot, dot, dot prompt. And so we now have this thing called greet. And now we've extended Python to add our own function to Python. And now we can say greet en. And so it runs this code except that en is lang. And so that comes and, and then it prints hello. So out comes hello. Now later we can say, oh, I would like to do a greeting. But this time I'm going to pass es in as it. So lang becomes, for this execution, es. And then so it prints out hola. And then the next execution, lang is fr. So it executes this three times, but lang is different each time because we've passed in different parameters each time. So that's how we can kind of write general purpose code inside the function and then reuse that general purpose code in different ways. Okay? It's a real powerful, powerful mechanism that makes functions far more useful. Now, functions don't necessarily just have to do stuff. A real powerful mechanism in a function is what we call a return value. So a function can take its arguments, do some work, we've seen that, and then it can return a value. And the key to the return value is when we call the function, like we were calling max, it gives us back some value, like the little w. Okay. So here we're going to make a function called greet that takes no parameters. do not take parameters, but it has another keyword. It's another reserved word in Python. And whatever we put on this return statement shows up as the replacement in this expression. So whatever greet is, it runs greet, and then the return is kind of a residual value. So if we say print greet comma Glenn, it says hello Glenn, because the return value for the greet function is the string hello. And if we say greet Sally, it says hello Sally. And so, and, and it's run the code twice, and the return function, return value has been put in here instead. And so the hello came there and the hello came there. So we get the two lines. So return is a statement 
that both terminates the execution of the function and defines the value of what will be replaced when the function call comes back in the line that the function was called from. So here is a, a little smarter version of our greet function. It's, uh, it's very similar. It's called greet still. It takes lang as a parameter. And uh, if the language is ES, then it returns the string hola. If the language is French, it returns bonjour. Otherwise, it returns hello. So we're not actually doing the print. If you go back on the other slides, we were printing. But now we're just returning a string. Okay? And so now I can call print greet and pass en in. So then that runs the code once with lang equal to en. And I get back hello and then comma glen. Then I call it again and I pass es in. And then that time it returns the return value here becomes hola, a string hola, hola Sally. And then Michael, I pass in one more time. Lang now is fr, the string fr. And so it returns uh, bonjour. And so the, the residual that is here is bonjour, and so out comes bonjour Michael. So there's a lot to this, right? You're passing stuff in, you have this kind of placeholder variable, and you have this return that sort of appears where it was called from. It goes in, does its work, it comes back, and there's sort of this residual value that sits here. You don't have to have a return in a function, but if you want to do something with a value, then you have to have a return in the function. We call the functions that produce values fruitful, and the other ones are called void. <laughs> so that's a good name for them. So to review sort of this arguments, parameters, and results, if we look at max, the original thing where it's looking for the largest, uh, largest lexographically largest letter, um, it looks hello world is the argument that's passed in. We have this sort of formal parameter here called imp, which is not really a variable. It just happens to refer to whatever is the first argument when in, the, in any particular call. And then it does its little thing and runs loops and does all these things. And at some point, it returns w so that the thing that comes out when the function quits that becomes the replacement value here is a lowercase w string. And then that is the w that goes over into big. So the return is what defines what comes back here. Because you think of this as, it's looking at this, it suspends for the moment, it runs this code, it's holding, it's holding itself here, it's running this code, and then it comes back to here. Okay? And the return value is what defines coming back. So, of course you can have more than one parameter, and they are in order. So here we have an A and a B. Uh, these, the name of these things doesn't really matter. They're just relevant inside of the function definition. So we are going to add two numbers together by taking a plus b and then returning the sum. The added variable is just kind of local to this function. And now we can say, you know, add to 3 comma 5, and then this will come back as 8, and then 8 will get assigned into x, and so that'll print out 8. And so you can have as many of these as you want, and the order matters, and there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. Uh, 3 goes to A and 5 goes to B when the thing is called. And then the return value, again, comes back. Okay? So that's sort of arguments. And like I said, uh, not all functions have to return values. We call them void functions when they ret don't return anything. It's uh, totally fine for that to be the case. So at this point, you might be thinking to yourself, okay, great, well, I still don't quite get why to use functions. And in reality, in the first 10, 11 chapters of this book, other than using lots of functions, we're not really going to spend a lot of time making functions because most of our programs are going to kind of be that long and we're not going to do a lot of reuse in the program. And there'll be a time when your programs become complex enough, you'll be like, oh, thank heaven for functions. I think it's premature to say you must use functions, even though there are some exercises that just say, hey, do this with a function, just so you kind of get the understanding of a function. Um, you will find soon enough, as your programs grow, you'll go like, oh, I keep doing the same thing over and over again. Let me pull that up into a function and pass a parameter in, have a return value, and away you go. Or you might find that you're moving from one program to another, and you have this common thing that you want to do, so you make yourself a library that you drag along. And we will do lots of libraries. Uh, the book in the second half does lots and lots of library stuff 
doing things like parsing XML and, and this, that, and the other thing. So, so don't feel like you need to use functions on every assignment because they're a natural thing when a program gets big enough. So, so, so just kind of understand them on a mechanical level, but it'll come to you at the right time when it's time to start building your own functions. So in this class, we kind of, you know, talked about functions, just got you started, talked about parameters, talked about built-in functions, talking talk about return values, the store and reuse pattern. So um, the, the problems at the end of the chapter for this particular chapter are, are relatively straightforward in that, I, I, like I said, I, it's, we don't have a real strong need to do functions yet in this class because the programs aren't large enough. But I just said, okay, take, take one of your previous assignments and refactor the code so that at the top there's a def, compute pay, and you put like the if and whatever in here, and then later on you do your code and then you call compute pay. So you took code that you already had, you move it up into a function and make a function. And I've also online got sort of a sample of this because it's a, it's a little complex and so uh, you should be able to find on Python Learn or on the course site, um, you should be able to find a good example because I really want you to sort of get this. Um, they'll, like I said, there will come a time when functions will make the most sense to you. But up, coming up next, of course, is chapter five, and that's loops. And loops are going to rock the house. And so we really, that's our fourth major pattern is loops, and, uh, and I'm looking forward to it. And so we'll, uh, we'll see you at the next lecture. Hello and welcome to Chapter 5, Loops and Iteration. As always, this lecture is copyright Creative Commons attribution, including the audio and the video and, and the slides and the book even. So now we're getting to our fourth basic pattern. Uh, we've talked about sequential, where steps happen one after another. We've talked about conditional, where steps may or may not happen. In Chapter 4, we talked about the store and retrieve pattern. And now we're going to talk about the looping pattern. And the looping pattern is the last of our really foundational ones, and it, it potentially is the most important one because it's the thing that allows us to get computers to do lots of things that, say, humans might get tired of, but computers don't tire of. And so after this, we'll start sort of becoming a little more skilled in the basic language capabilities. We'll uh, talk about strings and, and then start talking about files and start doing some real work um, after we get done with this. So... Bear with us. It's going to be a while, but uh, we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. So, welcome to uh, Repeated Steps. This is the example that I had uh, in the first, first lecture, Chapter 1. And the basic idea, just to review, is that you have this while keyword. The while keyword sort of functions like an if in that it implicitly has a decision that it's going to make. And it's either going to do the code in the indented block or not do it, or skip it, basically. Right? So you either do it or you skip it. The difference between the while and the if is that it's going to do it many times as long as this question that we have remains true. Okay, And so in this case, n is 5, while n greater than 0 functions like an if. So yes, it's going to run it. Prints out 5, subtracts 1, so it's 4. Goes back up, goes back up and ask the question again. Is n still greater than 0? Well, since it's 4, yes, we'll continue on. Out comes 4, then n gets subtracted. 3, 2, 3, 2, and then we come through, we print 1, print 1, we subtract n to 0, we go up, we go back up, n is now not greater than 0, so we come up and we execute outside the loop, we leave the loop, and that really means in the Python code we skip to whatever's lined up with the while statement, the in same indent level as the while statement. And so that's how it works. And I just print n at the end here to remind ourselves that n ended up at 0, not at 1. The last thing we printed out in the loop, the last thing we printed out in the loop was the 1, but n ended up at 0 because it was this loop was going to run as long as n was greater than 0, so n had to sort of be not greater than 0 to get out of the loop. Okay, So that's basically a review of what we've done. Now, oh, wait, 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 something else. Um, iteration variables. Okay, so the key to this is these loops can't run forever. We don't want them to run forever. We want them to run in t as long as we want them to run. They may run a very long time, um, but 
not forever. There's got to be a way to get out of them. Otherwise, we call them infinite loops, which we'll talk about in the next slide. And so the iteration variable is generally some variable that is changing each time through the loop. And we are changing it by subtracting 1 to it from it. And, and so this thing is going to keep running. And we can pretty much see that, oh, this is going to exit, right? Whatever n is, it could be a large number. But eventually, it's going to get to 0, right? So the iteration variable controls how many times the loop runs. And it also allows us to do something different inside the loop. And of course, this is like a trivia loop where we're just printing the iteration variable. But it just means that this loop is going to run five times. And it's going to do something potentially different each time. Uh, if you just ran the loop that did the same thing over and over and over again with no data changing, that's kind of dull and pointless. So just because you have an iteration variable doesn't mean that you've properly constructed your loop. It's a, it's a common problem, or something we want to avoid, is an infinite loop. And here is a, a carefully constructed loop. We start n at 5 at the beginning. We have a good question at the end, while n greater than 0. It's going to run this as long as n is greater than 0. Um, but the problem is, is we don't change in the little block. We don't change the n, which means it's going to come back, and n is going to be 5. And then it's going to run this, and then it's going to be 5. And then it's going to run this, and it's going to be 5. And so this is an infinite loop, which means this loop will never exit. It will never get out. It's just going to run forever in here because n's not changing. Neither of these statements change n. So part of the iteration variable is there needs to be something that changes so that the loop will ultimately make progress to accomplish what it is and know when to stop. So this is an infinite loop. And of course, lather, rinse, repeat is commonly put on shampoo and conditioner. Uh, and so, uh, you know, you can... Next time you're in the shower, take a look at your shampoo and conditioner and find the in infinite loop that's, that's on most bottles of shampoo and conditioner. Now, here's another loop. Just to emphasize that it's possible to structure these loops in a way that they never run. So this function is as an if. The while functions as an if. And so when n is set to 0 and we ask the question, it is literally going to make the decision based on n greater than 0. Well, it is not greater than 0, so it's going to go right by it. Over here, it's going to come in here and go right to there and never run these lines of code. And that's, we call this a zero trip loop. And that's okay. I mean, this is a silly one, of course. Um, it just shows that the test, the question that's being asked, is above the lines of, that make up the body of the loop. And if it's false, it, the loop never runs. So it's possible that these loops have zero trips. Okay? So that's a loop. Now, there are more than one way to sort of control the flow of a loop. Um, the basic flow of the loop is when it gets to the bottom, it goes back up to the while and, and does the check. This is a different way of getting out of a loop or controlling the execution of a loop. There is a keyword or a part of the Python language called... Um, color I got. Nope. Green's over here. Uh, called break. If you looked back at reserved words, break was one of the reserved words. Break says, hey, if I'm in a loop, stop the loop. Right? Get out of this loop. I'm done with this loop. And so here's this loop. Now the interesting we, thing we've done is I just got done talking to you about infinite loops. We have just constructed an infinite loop because the question is right there and the answer is yes. True. True, and that's a way to construct an infinite loop. We've done this because we have a different way of getting out of the loop. So we've constructed a loop that, just on the face of it, just looking at that line, looks like an infinite loop. So what this loop does is it reads a line of input, checks to see if it's the string that we've entered is done. And if it is, we're going to skip out with his break and get out of the loop. Otherwise, we're going to print it. So at a high level, what this loop is going to do is prompt for, for strings of characters until we enter done. And that's exactly what it does. It prompts, we say hello there, it prints that out. We say, we say finished, it prints that out. We say done, and it's done. So it, when we say done, it comes out and finishes the loop, and, and that's the end of the program. Okay, so to look at this in some more detail, um, the first time it comes in, does the raw input, because true is true, so it's going to run it, and then we enter hello there, it checks to see if what we'd entered is equal to the string done. It is not, so it skips, and it does the print. And we do this one more time, and we type finished. And then the line is 
not done. That variable line does not have the value done in it. So we print that. We come in one more time, but this time this is true. And so it goes in and executes the break, and then it escapes the loop. And so you can think of, right, here is the body of this loop, because that's where the indentation starts and ends. The break says, break me out of the current loop that I'm in and get to that next line that has the same indent as the while. So whatever it is, break says we are done with this loop. When that statement executes, we are done with the loop. We're finished with the loop. It'll run until that executes because we've got this set to be while true. Okay, so there's a simpler, I mean, this is sort of a simple way to draw this. Break is sort of a jump to the statement immediately following the loop. If you really want to picture this, I think of this as kind of like a Star Trek transporter where you kind of come into break and then poof, your molecules are sent to the four corners of the universe and you reassemble outside of the loop. And so if we look at this sort of in my little roadmap version of these things, right, the while loop is going to run for a while, yada, yada. There can actually be more than one break as long as they only get this. But the moment that somehow, some if or whatever, hits the break, then it gets out completely. And so it escapes the loop. And so it's sort of like um, you, 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 you're, you're zoom, 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 zoom. You come in here, and then you are, you are rematerialized outside the loop. That's what the break does. Okay? So break is one way to control the execution of loops. Now, another way to control the execution of loops that doesn't actually exit the loop is called continue. Continue basically says, hey, I'm done with this iteration of the loop. Now, each time through the loop is we call that an iteration. Continue says, I don't want to stop the loop, but I want to stop this iteration and advance to the next iteration. And so what we have here is we have the same basic loop, a while true, which kind of makes us an infinite loop. Um, we're going to read a line prompting with a less than sign. Um, and if it's done, we're going to break. That code is down here, and we're going to print it if we fall through. So normally we'll be reading and printing, and if the line is done, we're going to break out. That's what we just got done doing. But the new part is right here. And this is, we'll learn this in the next chapter. If line sub zero, if the first character of the line is a pound sign, we're going to continue. And what continue says is it doesn't actually get us out of the loop, it jumps back up to the top of the loop, which means that it ignores, for that iteration, the rest of the loop, right? So if execution comes in here, uh, let me clear that. If execution comes in here and hits this line, it goes back up to the while, okay? which means it, whatever this is, it's not coming out of this if. It's going back up to the while. Okay, So continue ends the current iteration and jumps to the top of the loop and starts the next iteration. And so if we look at how the code runs, hello there prints. Pound sign with the first character doesn't print, so there is no printout right here. Print this is not done, and we enter done, and then the loop ends. Now another way to sort of draw this is the continued jumps to the top of the loop. It, it does run the question, right? It does check the question. And so here's another way to, to draw that picture. And so here again we have a loop and it's happily running and there can be breaks in there and there can be continues in there. And as long as we don't hit a break or continue, the loop just sort of runs and goes up to the top. And at some point, some if, we hit the continue and like a transporter, Instead of going out of the loop, we go to the top of the loop. But it's important that we go and we check the question, right? So the continue is not likely to exit the loop unless the question has become false. So the continue is likely to come up here, run some more. Then we hit the continue, it comes up here. Oops, oops, I did that backwards. Run some more. Clear this out. So the continue could run many times, right? So we have the loop. Loop runs a bunch of times. Then finally we hit the continue. Continue goes up to the top. If it's still true, we'll run the loop some more. Then you might hit the continue. Then you might go up to the top, come down, round and round and round and round, hit the continue again, go up to the top, yada yada. Now in this in this particular loop, this break eventually is down here, and that's how we get out. Okay. So the continue goes back up to the top of the loop. So these loops that we construct with the while keyword are what we call indefinite loops. I mean, looking at the ones that we've written, which are 
two lines or six lines, we can kind of inspect them and understand when they're going to stop. And we're going to know that they're possible to stop them. A loop that won't stop is an infinite loop. Um, sometimes these loops can be rather <coughs> complex, and you may not actually be able to look at them because they're many lines, and and uh, and and so we don't know. And so so it's real careful. You have to be real careful when you construct these to make sure that they stop as as things get more complicated. Now the cousin to indefinite loops are definite loops. And definite loops is something where we have a list of things or a set of things that are a kind of a known set of things, a finite set of things. And we're going to write a loop that's going to go through that set of things and do something to each thing in that set of things. And the keyword that we'll use for this is the for. So we use the Python for keyword that says we're going to write a loop, but instead of it just running until some condition becomes true or false or we hit a break, um, we're actually going to know how many times this is going to run. Now you can actually use break and continue in for loops. We call these definite loops because the how long they're going to run is kind of well known, basically. So here's a simple definite loop. And it's kind of like that while loop that we just got done looking at, where it's counting down and then saying blast off. And so the way we construct this loop is we have the for keyword, which is part of the Python language, the in keyword, and then we have an iteration variable. I've chosen i as my iteration variable. And basically what we're saying is, dear Python, run this indented block. And there's only one line in the indented block. Run it once for each of the values in this little list. This is a Python list. Square brackets make Python lists, comma separated values. So it says, I would like i to be 5 then run this code. Then I would like i to be 4, then run this code. Then I would like i to be 3, then run this code. i should be 2, then run this code. And i should be 1, then run this code. And so this is a, a pretty clear, and I like this word in. It says, you know, doop, 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 and then run this each time. And so out of that comes 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and then the loop is done. We, Python is doing all the tricky bits here. Python's figuring all these things out for us and handling all this, and then we're done. And so it's, it's, if you look at it, we have an iteration variable, but we didn't have to increment it. We didn't have to do anything. Python took care of a lot of things for us. And so when we're looping through known list of things, or later when we read a file, we're going to be loop through the lines in the file. And so the for loop is a really nice, powerful, and it's syntactically cleaner. It's really quite nice. Now, it's important to realize that you don't have to just loop through numbers. I did that one with a set of descending numbers so that it was equivalent to the while loop that I started at the beginning. But this is a loop where what it's going to loop through, through is a list. Close square brackets are a list in Python. This is a list of three strings, Joseph, Glenn, and Sally. They're string constants, and then commas are how we make lists. And so friends is a mnemonic variable. Python doesn't know anything about friends in particular, but I've chosen this variable name to be friends. And it's a list of three people, Joseph, Glenn, and Sally. And so I have an iteration variable called friend, and I'm going to loop through the set of friends. Now, Python doesn't know anything about singular. Python doesn't know anything about plural. I'm just choosing these variable names because it makes a lot of sense. This is a set of friends, because it has three of them in it. And this is a single friend. What it's really going to do is friend is going to take on the successive values, Joseph, Glenn, and Sally. And this little block of code is going to run once for each of those three items in the set. And the variable friend is going to take on the successive values of that set. So out of this comes three lines of printout. Happy New Year, Joseph. Happy New Year, Glenn. Happy New Year, Sally. And of course, this is the I bit right down over here. But we just made it so, hey, Python, look, however many friends there are, run this code one time for each one. Change this variable friend to be each of the successive ones in order and then we print that we're done. Okay. So the for loop, sort of we go and try to make a picture of the for loop. The for loop is kind of a powerful thing. It's, does, it does two things. It decides if we're done or not, how do we keep going in the loop, or, well, I mean, and as long as we keep going, we're going to advance the i value, the iteration variable. It takes care of it, the responsibility of changing the iteration variable. We do not have to add lines of code in that change the iteration variable. Okay. And so, if we take a look, you know, we come in, are we done? We're not done. Set i to the right thing, then print it. Out comes 5, 
advance I, advance I, print it, advance it, print it, advance it, print it. Oh, now we're done, right? I was not the thing that decided when we were done. The for loop just keeps track internally as I moves through these things and it goes like, oh, I'm all done. I'll take care of that. I, 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 you finished. So it doesn't. There's no if in here. It's not like if I equals one. Stop. No, no, no. It just says you told me to do five things. I'm going to do five things, and then we're going to stop. And so again, the for loop, the for loop here, has got sort of two functions: decides how long the loop's going to run and changes the duration variable based on what you've told it to in this in clause. Okay. So I think in is a real elegant construct. It's just a keyword, but it's sort of, if you think about math, math, if you're familiar with sets, it's like something inside of a set of something. I think it's a real pretty way to think about it. Um, and you can kind of think of it a little more abstractly that you say, well, here's a little indented block of code, right? And I want it to run some number of times for each of the I values in the set, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. That's how I kind of think of it. So I, I think this is a real pretty syntax. Different languages have different looping syntax. I think this is really a very expressive, very pretty one. Yeah. So another way to th so 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 one way to think about this picture is that you know the for loop causes sort of repeated execution, and there's, we're driving in the circle, and then we stop, right? The other way to think about this is to to not to think about it a little more abstractly, right? To say, hmm, you know, at the end of the day, all I'm really telling Python is I want to execute this block of code five times, and I want the variable i to change from to these three values. So in a way, you could think of this as expanded as the for loop sets it to five, then runs your code. The for loop then sets it to four, runs your code. The for loop sets it to three, runs your code. For loop sets it to two, runs your code. Sets it to one, runs your code. These two ways of looking at it are the same from your perspective because you're just asking Python to do something. Whether it does it this way or whether it does it this way, you hardly can tell the difference. It's probably going to do it this way. But logically, it's not that different. It's not different from doing it this way. You're saying, run this block of code, change i in the following way. Cool. It's like we don't have to worry. I mean, we can use mentally either model of what's going on inside because it doesn't matter because they're the same. OK, so these definite loops are really cool. Uh, starting in a couple of chapters, we'll mostly use definite loops to go through lists or dictionaries or tuples or files. Uh, and so it's a finite set of things. It can be a large set of things, but it's a finite set of things. Loop idioms are how we construct loops. And we're going to, the, the loops kind of have some kind of a goal in mind. Finding the largest, we played with that. Finding the smallest, counting the number of things, looking for lines that start with pound sign, something like that. They, they have a kind of a high level view of what they're supposed to do. And then we have to kind of build a loop to accomplish that. And, and this goes back to how we have to think like a computer, right? We have to say, hey, computer, do this over and over and over again, and then I'll get what I want once you've done that over and over again. You have to do something a million times. I'm not going to sit here and wait. At the end, I'll get what I want. So I call these kind of smart loops, or how, how to kind of build intelligence into loops. So for example, we want the largest number, right? But we have to construct a loop that will get us the largest number thinking like a computer, okay? Thinking computationally, thinking like a computer. So the idea is that we have some kind of a loop, and there's, we're going to go through this list, some list of things, and this is going to run a bunch of times. And But the way we're going to do it is we're going to set something up before the loop starts. We're going to do something to each of the things that's being looked at. And at the end, we're going to get the result we're looking for. Okay, And so in the middle, it's kind of like working. It's in the middle working, da 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 And then here is the payoff. The payoff is at the end when we get the information that we're interested in. So I will sort of use in the next few examples this simple loop. And uh, right now it doesn't do much. It does a print before and it has this variable thing that goes through the successive values of these numbers and it prints it out, right? So that middle part 
it says run this six times, once for each of those values, and then after. Okay, and so we will add some intelligence at the beginning, we'll add some intelligence in the middle, and we'll add some intelligence at the end, and then the whole thing will accomplish what we want. Right now, this is kind of not that intelligent. So now what I want to do is I want to review the thing we did, and I want you to remember what the largest number is, and I'm going to show you a sequence of numbers in order. Ready? I'll do it kind of quickly because you've seen this before. So I'm only showing you one number at a time, so you want to tell me what the largest number is. So here we go. The first number is 9. The second number is 41. The third number is 12. The fourth number is 3. The fifth number is 74. And the sixth number is 15. So what was the largest number? Did you have to go back? Or did you remember how to do it? Okay, well, I will give you a clue. It was 74. Okay? That's because I know. Okay, now if you did that, and you had to do that for 20 or 30 numbers, you'd have to create a mental algorithm in your head to approach it and stay concentrated, focused. So, you would have created a variable in your head called largest so far. I would show you the first number, which would be 9, and you would go, hmm, well, 9 is larger than one, negative 1, so I will keep that. That's the new largest I've seen so far. That's pretty awesome, because it's way better than negative 1. 41, I thought 9 was good, but 41, that is a lot better, so I'm going to keep that one. That's the, that's the best. It's the largest we've seen so far. We've only seen two numbers, but the best we've seen so far is 41. So, 12, that's not larger. Who cares about that? It's not as big as 41, so we'll just go right on to the next, on to the next. Three. That's lame when we're looking for large numbers. So we skip, whoa, 74, 74. That's a rockingly large number. So we're going to, that's a lot. That's actually the largest we've seen so far because it's bigger than 41, and 41 was the former champion largest we've seen so far. And there's 74, so we keep that one. I don't know how many letters we're, uh, these things we're going to see, right? We could see lots of them. But um, the next one we see 15. Well, pff, that's no good. We got 74 already. 74 is like totally awesome, right? So now, oh, we're done. So, hey, we're done. And so 74 is the champion. That is the largest. It's not even the largest so far anymore. It's actually the, the largest. It's the largest. So, again, we had this thing at the top. We had this loop in the middle, and at the bottom is where you kind of get the payoff. And the payoff is not in the middle. While we were largest so far, largest so far, largest so far, but at the end, it turned out, once you've looked at all the variables, all the values, the largest so far is indeed the largest. Okay, so here's the algorithm for this. I'm going to have some variables, and remember that underscores are valid characters in variables. Now, <clears throat> I'm being a little ex over explicit in this. So I have a variable called largest so far. Then what I do is I set it to one, negative 1. Then I print before so we can see that largest so far is negative 1. Then we have a for loop, and my variable iteration variable is the underscore num. So that's going to take on the successive values 9, 41, 12, 3, 74, 15, and run this indented loop of code. Okay? And so the num will be 9 first time through. If the num, 9, is greater than largest so far, then grab the num and assign it into largest so far. Then print at the end of the, each loop largest so far and the num. So, so in effect, the num is 9. We compare it to negative 1, and negative one is, uh, 9 is higher, so we make largest so far be 9. Next time through the loop, next time through the loop, num is 41. So we compare largest so far with 41, and we like it, so we store it. So we like it, we run it, and we print out 41 is the largest we've seen so far. Then we run again, we come in, the num now points to 12. The num, 12, is not greater than 41. And so we skip. So the largest so far stays 41, and we see 12. Similarly, the num advances to 3. We skip. So we saw 3, but the largest so far is still 41. 
Continuing, the num is now 74. It runs. 74 is greater than 41. And so we run this code. And so we say uh, 74 is stuck in largest so far. And indeed, then we print it out. And largest so far is now 74. We continue on. We go up one more time. The num points to 15. But 15 is not larger than 74. And so we skip. We print out 15 and 74. And then we come out. And at the end, at the end, we get the largest so far. It, the name no matter, no longer, I mean, it's kind of largest so far at the end is the largest, but the variable name. Okay? Got it? That's one idiom. So, let's just switch to another idiom. Now, counting. How many things are we going to, how many times is the loop going to execute? How many things are we going to find in the loop? It's all kind of the same notion. And the pattern is really simple. We start some variable zork. A better name for this would be count, but I want to call it zork. And then we have a loop. And then in the loop, we just add one to zork. And at the end, zork, and that should be light blue right there, zork should be the total count. Now, of course, we can look at it and say it's going to be six. But assume this loop is looping through a million lines in the file or something like that. So it's, so it's cheating to kind of look at it and say, ooh, it's six, because we want to actually compute it. So it's really simple. You know, zork starts at zero. It's going to run. Zork is 1 now, and 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and then we've run out of stuff, and then we print out 6. Okay? So that's kind of the idiom, right? Before, during, and after. Right? We do something before, we do something during, and, it, and in a sense, this Zork here is the number we've seen so far. And at the end, it becomes kind of the total number. Summing in a loop, very similar. Again, you have to think of this as there's a whole bunch of variables here. We start a variable at 0. Each time through the loop, we add whatever it is that we're seeing. Instead of adding 1, we're adding 9, 41, 12, 3, 7, 4, 15. And Zork would be best thought of as running total. So Zork is the running total. And so if you look at the numbers, 9 is it a Running total is 9, running total is 50, running total is 62, 65, 139, 154. And then we skip out, and at the end, the running total becomes the total. Okay? So that's another of these patterns that sort of we do something at the beginning, we do something in the middle, and we have uh, something very nice for ourselves at the end. Finding the average of a sequence of values is the combination of the two previous patterns. This time I'm going to use more mnemonic variables, a variable called count. Everyone calls this count. Sum, now the total would maybe be a better word for this, the running total. And then, so the count and the sum start out at zero, and then each time through the loop, count equals count plus one, so we're adding one to count. Sum equals sum plus value, so we're adding one to, to sum. I mean, adding the value. Value, of course, being 9, 41, 12, 3, 74, 15. And then at the very end, we can print out the number. We have six things with a total of 154, and then we calculate the average. Of course, these are integer numbers, and so this is a truncating division. So 154 over 6 equals 25 and not 25 point something. If we were in Python 3000, Python 3, it would be better. But So the average, the integer average is of the numbers we just looked at is 25. So sometimes we're searching, like for a needle in a haystack, uh, looking for something. Um, and again, you have to think of like you're handed some amount of data and you got to hunt for something. And there might be a million things and you might only want five of them. And you can either look by hand or you can write a loop that's got an if statement that says found it. Maybe I found it at line 7 or found it wherever. So this is filtering or finding or searching, looking for a needle in a haystack in a loop. And so the, the idea basically is, is that we have this loop. It's going to go through all the values, 9, 41, 12, 3, 74. But we put in the loop, we embed an if statement. If the value we're looking at is greater than 20, print, I found it. So when value is 9, this is going to do nothing and just go and make value be 41. And then value 41, oh, yep, there we go, print large number, so out this comes. Then value becomes 12, 
nothing happens, value becomes 3, nothing happens, value becomes 74, oops, this time it's going to happen, so out comes large number 74, then value becomes 15, nothing happens, and then value is all done, and so it comes and finishes. So this is the searching, or filtering, or catching, or, or whatever, okay? We can also sort of if we don't just want to print everything out, we want to say, is something in there? Go look through this million things and tell me if blah exists. And in this, we're going to introduce the notion of Boolean variable. Uh, Boolean is a true-false. It only has two values, and we've already used it in the while true. So that capital true, that is a constant. It's just like 7 or 42 or 99 or Sam. Um, and so we're going to make this variable called found. Now found is a mnemonic value, variable. It's just a name I picked. So found equals false. This is going to be false until we find what we're looking for, and then it's going to switch to true. So it starts out and it's false. Then we're going to run this bit of code three times. Um, and if the value that we are looking at is three, then we're going to set found to be true. And we'll print found value each time through. So value is going to take on 9, 41, 12, 3, 74. So we get a line of output for each one. And the first time through, it's not yet found because we're looking at a 9. The second time, we've not yet found. We looked at 41. Still false. So it could stay false for a long time. Oh, we found a true. And then that means that this code's going to run once. And so you can kind of think of this found variable as sticky. It's going to stay false. And then the rest of the loop is going to stay true. And at the end, it is true. Now, the way we usually do these kinds of things is we don't bother with this print statement, so we wouldn't see all this stuff. All we would see is before, false, after, true. And after would just tell us that, yeah, we found it. There was a 3 somewhere in that long list of numbers. Okay, I'm just adding this print statement so we can kind of trace it. But basically, this loop sort of from here to here is asking the question, is there the number 3 in the list that we're about to go through? Okay? Now, how could, I'll just give you a second and ask you a quick question. You can pause if you want. How could you improve this loop using the break? Where might you put a break to make this loop smarter? It's okay if you didn't, if it doesn't jump out at you. So if you think about it, once you hit true, there's really little point in looking at the rest of them. There just is no point. So we could put a break right here inside this block. You say, look, I'm looking for a 3. All I care is whether I found it or not. If I find it, I mark it to true that I found it, and I get out of the loop. Why bother? Why do all these things? All right, just get out. Okay? So don't worry about it. I'm just pointing that out. That that's one of the places where break could be used. The loop functions either way, it just, it just looks through all the rest of them as well. Here's this largest value one that I've used before. And, you know, away we go. We, you know, we have largest so far. We check to see if the one we're looking at is better. And if, if it is, we keep it. And then away we go. And we find that the largest is 17. What if, what would you have to change in this code? to make this search for the smallest of all the values. Like point, point where in the screen. Where, what would you have to change to make this look for the smallest in a list of values? What is the nature of what's making this about being largest? What would you have to change? Okay, pause if you like. So here is some things that you might do to make it work about smallest. So hey, one thing we would do, let's change the name of the variable. We had a variable named largest so far, and now we'll change it to be called smallest so far. Changing the variable name doesn't change the program at all. But it makes the program easier to read if the program works. So it's like smallest so far. Okay, but that didn't make it about being small. The thing that made it about being small is change this greater than to a less than. Because we're kind of thinking when we're doing largest so far, if the number we're looking at is bigger than the largest so far, we keep it. If the number we're looking at in the smallest is smaller than the smallest so far, then we want to keep it. So this is like keep. This line here is the keeping line. 
and this is the win line, win to keep. We'll keep it if it's smaller. Okay? So that's the key. And, I, and so, yeah, so I name it smallest so far, whoop de doo. That, that's good. But the real thing that had this being about largeness and smallness was whether this is less than and greater than. And this was the repeated code that got rechecked over and over again. So, but this still has a bug in it. So let's run this visually. Okay, so now we've got a variable called smallest so far. We are going to check to see if a series of numbers that I'm about to show you are smaller than the smallest so far. So the first number is 9. Is that smaller than negative 1? No, it's not. Negative 1 is smaller. The second number is 41. Is that smaller than negative 1? No, it is not. The next number is 12. Is that smaller than negative 1? No. Negative 1 is smaller than 12. 3? No. Not smaller. 74? No. Not smaller. 15? Not smaller. So, we're all done. Yay! And the smallest number we saw on the list is... Negative 1? Negative 1 wasn't even in the list. So that's not a very good program. So let's take a look at what went wrong with this program. So we fixed it. We fixed it as best we could. All right, we made it. We changed the words largest to smallest. Yay, that'll fix just makes it more readable. It doesn't actually change the program. And we made this less than. So now what happens is it comes in. If 3 is less than negative 1, smallest so far, of course, is negative 1, it, this just never runs. This never runs. And so as we print, smallest so far stays negative 1. And oops, that should be negative 1 right there. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot to fix that. Here, let me magically fix that. Boom. So let's take a look at what went wrong with this. So here we have the code. Smallest so far is negative 1. We have it fixed so that we're checking, looking for smaller numbers rather than larger numbers by turning this to less than. But the first time through, smallest so far is negative 1, and the num is 3. 3 is not less than negative 1, so we skip through. And the printout at the first line is negative 1, 3. And doesn't take long to realize it's just going to keep doing this. Smallest so far is going to stay negative 1 no matter what we look at on this side. And then we're going to come out the end and we end up with negative 1 as the answer. Not very good. So the question is what should we make this value be? Negative 1 it barely worked in the largest because we were working with positive numbers. And so starting with negative 1 is the largest so far was a reasonable assumption as long as the numbers were all positive. But what would be a good number to choose here? Think about that for a second. Pause if you have to. Let me clear it. Let me make it real clear. What's the right thing to put here? Okay. So... What? A million? That might work. Or a million might work. But what if this number, you know, was, you know, what if, what if, what if all these numbers were um, larger than a million? Okay, then, then that wouldn't work. So the problem is, is there's no real good value unless you could make this be somehow infinity. Okay, uh, you could make this be infinity. But there's a way to do this in Python, and it's a really kind of cool technique. It's sort of a way we signal ourselves, and that is we're going to use a special value. Not negative 1, it's not a number, and the special value we're going to use is none. It's a different type. It's not a number. It's itself its own type. So what we're going to do is we're going to mark smallest as none. And, and, and sort of at a high level, what we're really saying is um, we haven't seen anything so far. The smallest we've seen so far is none. We've not seen anything so far. Now we have to change our loop, our little if inside the loop. This is this intelligence in the middle. First we say if smallest is none. Is is an operator, part of the Python language. If smallest is none, 
exactly the same as none, then the smallest we've seen so far is the value. Now this is going to happen the first time. Because smallest starts out none, and then as soon as we set smallest to the value, it's going to be that first number. So it's going to be 9. Okay, so smallest is quickly going to become 9. Then we print out the, new sm the smallest is 9 after we've seen the 9. Then we go up to the top and we say, is smallest none? And the answer is, no, it is not, because smallest is now 9. Then this else if is going to ask, is the value we're looking at, which is 41, is the value less than smallest? Well, no, it is not. 9 is smaller than 41. And so in a sense, after the first time that's executed, after the first time the statement is executed, this is going to always be false, right? Because smallest is no longer none. And this is going to be the thing that really is operating. And then it's going to work. And when we, you know, smallest will become 9. The smallest so far is 9, but then we see the 3 finally. And the value of the 3 is less than 9. And so then we take 3 and we stick it into smallest. And we end up with this. And then the loop runs some more times. And when we're all done, we have 3. So the trick here is we put this none in, and we have a little more if code to check to see if we haven't seen anything so far. This is what you can think of this as a way to trigger on the first, first iteration. Special code that's really going to, it could, it looks at it on each iteration, but it's never true after the first iteration. Okay? So that's just a technique. So this is and the is not operator, I think, is a real elegant thing. Um, don't start overusing it. It's um, at a low level, its real meaning is exactly the same as in type and value. Um, there's an is and there's an is not. Um, but don't like say like if don't don't do things like saying if I equal. Uh, oops, <laughs> I won't even let myself type the bad code. If I is four. Don't say that. Okay? Don't say that. Don't don't do if I is four. Um, it, it, it may work in certain situations. It's really best used in very limited situations where you're checking for some of these special values like none and false. Okay? The problem is, is if you use equality here, it tries to kind of convert values and it may end up giving you a false yes. And so is is a stronger equality than simple equals. Um, equals is same value, same numeric value, whereas is is exactly the same thing. But don't, don't overuse is. Use double equals 95% of the time and use is when you're checking if it's one of these special constants like true or false. Okay? Okay, so this is a iterations. I mean, our loops are going to get more sophisticated and we have more interesting things to do, but we, you know, we talked about some indefinite loops, definite loops, iteration variables, some patterns like maximum, minimum, summing, averaging. You know, we introduced the concept of none, you know, and and uh, and so this is we're getting there. We got a couple more chapters before we really start hitting the data analysis. So, see you in the next lecture. Hello, and welcome to chapter 6. This chapter we're going to talk about strings, and stuff is going to start to get real now. So, as always, this material, this video, these slides and book, and copyright, Creative Commons attribution. I want you to use these materials. I want you to, somebody else, I want to make more teachers so everyone can teach this stuff. Use it however you like. Okay, so we've been playing with strings from the beginning. I mean, literally, if we didn't work with strings, we could have never printed Hello World. And, and Lord knows we need to print Hello World in a programming language. And so we've been using them, especially constants. Um, now in this chapter we're going to dig in. So, oops. So a string is a sequence of characters. Uh, you can either use single quotes or double quotes in Python uh, to delimit a string. And so here's uh, two string constants, hello and there, and stuck into the variables stir1 and stir2. Uh, we can concatenate them together with a plus sign. Python is smart enough to look and say, oh, those are strings. I know what to do with those. Um, and you'll notice that the plus doesn't add any space here because when we print Bob out, um, hello and there are right next to one another. Um, 
if for, for example we've done some conversions so when we're like reading pay and rate and hours and stuff we've done some conversions so this is an example of the a string one two three not 123 but the string quote one two three quote uh, and we can't add one to this we get a uh, trace back kind of at this point as we expected and we would uh, convert that to an integer using the int function that's built in see how much python you already know i mean this is awesome right i can just say oh you call the int function and you know what that is that's Sorry, sorry, I'm just awesome doubt. So you convert this to an integer, and then you add one to it, and then we get 124. So there you go. We've been doing strings all along, had to. I mean, literally, strings and numeric data are the two things that uh, programs deal with. So we've been reading and converting. Again, this is sort of a pattern from some of the earlier programs where we do a raw input, you know, and the raw input just takes a string and puts it in a variable. So if I take Chuck, then the variable contains the string C-H-U-C-K. Uh, even if we type numbers, that is a string. We can't, just because I put 100 in, I still can't subtract 10. We get a happy little trace back. Oh, happy little sad face trace back. Um, and, uh, and, but of course, if we convert it int or float or something like that, if we convert int or float, we can do that and subtract 10 and we can do that. So, so we've been doing this for a while. We've been doing strings and manipulating strings and converting strings all along. So the thing we're going to start doing now is we're going to dive into strings. We realize that strings are addressable at a character-by-character -character basis, and we can do all kind of cool things with that. And so uh, a string is a sequence of characters, and we can look inside them using what we call the index operator, the square brackets. And we've seen square brackets in lists, and you'll see that there's sort of similarities between lists of numbers and in effect a string is a special kind of list of characters. So if we take the spring, string banana, the string banana starts, at, the first character starts at zero, so we call this operator sub. So letter equals fruit sub one and that is the second character. Now this may seem a little weird that the first character is a zero and the second character is a one. It actually is kind of similar to the old elevator thing where in Europe they're called the first floor is zero and then negative one and the second floor is one. All right, it's kind of the same thing. Actually, it turns out that internally zero is a better way to start than one. Um, it, you'll get used to it and then after a while there's some little cool advantages to it. But for now, beginning is zero. Just beginning is zero. It is the rule. Just remember it. Okay, so the zero is B, the one is A, the two is N, etc., etc and we call this syntax fruit sub one, okay? So that is the sub one character of fruit, and then that is an A. So that fruit sub one says, look up in banana, find the one position, and give me what's in that one position. That's what the sub. And what's inside these brackets can be an expression. So if we set n to three, n minus one, well, that'll compute to two, and then fruit sub two is the letter n. Right, so that's fruit sub 2. Okay, it's the third character, fruit sub 2. So the index starts at 0. The, we read the brackets as sub, fruit sub 1, fruit sub 2. Now, Python will complain to you if you use this sub operator too far down the string. Here is a character with 3, which is 0, 1, and 2. If we go to sub 5, it blows up. Now, you know, by now, I hope that you're not freaking out about traceback errors. Remember, traceback errors are just Python trying to inform you. And if we just stop looking at that as mean Python face and instead look at that as, oh, index error, string index out of range. Oh, yeah, I stuck a five in there and there's only three. Oh, my bad. Thank you, Python. Appreciate it. Thanks for the help. So think of this as like, it's not a smiley face, but it's kind of like a, a quizzical face, right? It's like, hey, I don't know. So Python's confused, and it's trying to tell you what it's confused, okay? So don't look at these as sad faces. Python doesn't hate you. Python loves you. Python loves me, too. So strings have individual characters that we can address with the index operator. They also have length, and there is a built-in function called len that we can call and pass in as a parameter the variable or a constant, and it will tell us how many characters. Now this banana has six characters in it that are 0 through 5. So don't get a little confused. The last character is the fifth is sub 5, 
but it's also the sixth character. So the length is really the length. It's not length minus one. Okay? So len is like a built-in function. It's not a function we have to write, as we talked about in chapter the functions chapter. There are things that are part of Python that are just sitting there. And so we are passing banana, the variable fruit, into function. We're passing it into function. And then into the len function. Then len shh, does magic stuff. And then out comes the answer. And that 6 replaces this. And then the 6 goes into the variable x. And so x is 6. I sure made that a messy looking slide. And so think of inside the len function. There's a def len takes a parameter, does some loopy things, and it does its thing. So it's a function that we might write, except we don't have to, because it's already written and built into Python. OK, so that's the length of the string. That's getting it individual characters. We can also loop through strings. Obviously, if we can use the index operator and we can put a variable in there, we can write a loop. This is an indefinite loop. So we have this variable fruit has the string banana in it. We set the variable index to 0. We make a little while loop. And we ask, as long as index is less than the length of fruit, now remember the length of fruit is going to be 6, but we don't want to make that less than or equal to because then we would crash because the last character is 5. We can say letter is equal to fruit sub index, so that's going to start out being index sub is going to be 0, so that's fruit sub 0. Then we print index and letter, so that means the First time through the loop, we're going to see 0b. Then we increment our iteration operator. Then we go up. And then we come out with 1a. And index advances until index is 6, but has printed out each of the letters. Now, we're not doing this to just to print them out. We will do something a little more valuable valuable inside that loop. But this gives us the sense that we can work through a loop just why, like we, 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 we can work through a string just like we work through a list of numbers. Okay? Now, so that was how you do it with an indefinite loop. In a definite loop, it's just far more awesome. Okay? Just like we did with the list of numbers, Python understands strings and allows us to write for loops using for and in that go through the strings. So basically, for letter and fruit, now remember, I'm using letter as a mnemonic variable here. It's just a choice, a wise choice of a variable name. So that says, run this little block of text once for each letter in the variable fruit, which means that letter's going to take on the successive B, A, N, A, N, A. When I look at that, I always worry that I misspelled it. I think I got these right. They've if I rewrite this book, I'm not going to use banana as the example because I'm terrified that I misspelled banana because I don't know how many ends banana has in it. But be that as it may, we are abstracting. We are letting Python say, run this little block of text once in order for each of the letters in the variable fruit, which is BANA, and so it prints out each of the letters. So this is a much prettier version of the, the, the looping. So using the definite, the for keyword instead of the while keyword. And so we can just kind of compare these two things. They kind of do the exact same thing. And it also is kind of a gives you a sense of what the for is doing for us, right? The for is setting up this index. The for is looking up inside of fruit. And the for is advancing the index. So the for is doing a bunch of work for us. And I've characterized that sort of in the previous lecture, how the for is sort of doing a bunch of things for us. And that's it allows our code to be more expressive and and instead of so this is a lot of this just kind of bookkeeping crap um, that we don't really need and so the for loop helps us by doing some of the bookkeeping for us okay so we can do all those loop idioms we can find the largest letter the smallest letter the how many times so I think I what a, how many n's are in this, or how many a's are in this. And so this is a simple counting pattern and a, and a looking pattern. And so our word is banana, our count is zero. For the letter in word, again, boop, 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 that comes out like that. So it's going to run this little block. If the letter is a, add one to the count. So this is going to basically print out, at the end, the number of a's in banana. It would probably be more useful for me to print out the number of ends in banana, because I never know how many ends are in banana. 
but it looks like there's supposed to be two, or otherwise I have a typo on this slide. So the in, again, I, I love the in. I just absolutely love this in. I love this syntax. This for each letter in the word banana. I just To me, it reads very smoothly. Cognitively, it fits in my mind what's going on. For each letter in banana, run this little indented block of text. Again, very pretty. I love in. It's one of my favorite little pieces of Python. So again, with the for, it takes care of all the iteration variables for us, and it goes through the sequence. And so here's here's an animation, right? Remember that the for is going to do all this work for us, right? Letter is going to advance through the successive value, the successive letters in banana. So letter is being moved for us by the for statement. Okay, so that's looping through. Now it turns out there's a lot of common things that we want to do that are already built into Python for us. Um, clear the old screen there. Um, we call these slicing. So the index operator looks up various things in a string, but we can also pull substrings out using the colon in addition to the square brackets. Again, this is called slicing. So the colon operator basically takes a starting position and then an ending position, but the ending position is up to but not including the second one. So this is, it's up to but not including, up to but not including, just like the zero, you get used to it pretty quick, but the first time you see it, it's a little bit uh, wonky. So if we're going zero through four, that's how I read this print s sub zero through four, or better better said s zero up to but not including four. That is print me out the chunk that is up to but not including four. So it doesn't include four, and so out comes mont. All right. So the next one is 6 up to but not including 7. So it starts at 6 up to but not including 7. So out comes the P. And even though you might expect that it would trace back on this, Python is a little forgiving. So here's a moment where Python is a little forgiving, saying, you know, I'll give you a break here. If you go 6 but up to but not including 20, I'll just stop at the end of the string. So 6 to the end. So it, it, you can over-reference here, and you cannot get, you won't get yourself in trouble. So that comes out of Python. So again, the second character is up to but not including, and that's the kind of the weird thing there. Of course, once you remember that the first character is zero, zero up through but not including. Nice. If we leave off the first or the last number, leaving off the first number, the last number, and both of them they mean the beginning and end of the string, respectively. And so uh, up to but not including two is M-O. Um, eight colon means starting at eight to the end of the string. So that's thon. And then that means the beginning of the end, and so it's just the whole string, Monty Python. Now we've already played with a string concatenation. Just the thing to emphasize here is the concatenation operator does not add a space, does not add a space. If you want a space, you explicitly add it. So here there's no space in between the, the O and the T, but here there is a space between the O and the T because we explicitly added it. So you can concatenate more than one thing and you add your spaces as you want. Okay. Another thing you can do is you can ask questions about a string, sort of like uh, doing a string lookup using the in operator. This is a little different than how we use it inside of a for loop. This is a logical operation asking a question like less than or greater than or whatever. So here is an expression. So fruit is banana as always. Is n in fruit? And the answer is yes it is. True. So this is a logical operation. It's a question. It's a true or false. Is m in fruit? No. False. And you can. this can be a string, not just a single character. Is N-A-N in fruit? The answer is true. And you can put sort of, you know, if parts of ifs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a logical expression that can be on an if. You can have a while, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a logical, logical expression and it returns true or false. You can also do comparisons. Now the comparison operations 
equals makes a lot of sense, less than and greater than depend on the language that you're using Python. And so if you're using like a Latin character set, then alphabetical matters, uh, you know, the, the way the Latin character set would do. But if you're in a different character set, Python is aware of multiple character sets and will sort strings based on the sorting algorithm of the particular character set. So you can do comparisons like equality, less than, and greater than. And we've seen some of these things in previous lectures, actually. We've had to use them. So in addition to sort of these sort of fundamental operations that we can do on strings, um, there's an extensive library of built-in capabilities in Python. And uh, so the, the way we see these built-in capabilities are they're, they're actually sort of built into strings. So let's go real slow here. Here we have a variable called greet, and we're sticking the string hello Bob into it. Now greet is of type string as a result of this, and it contains hello Bob as its value. But we can actually access capabilities inside of this value. So we can say greet dot lower parenthesis. This is calling something that's part of greet itself. It's a part of all strings. The fact that greet contains a string means that we can ask for, hey, give me greet, which just gives you back what you're looking for. Like here, print greet is hello, Bob. Or you can say, give me greet lower. So this is giving me a lowercase copy. It doesn't convert it to lowercase. It gives me a lowercase copy of hello, Bob. So zap is hello, Bob, all lowercase. Now, it didn't change greet, right? And you can even put this dot lower on the end of constant. So why you do this, I don't know. But hi there, with H and T capitalized, dot lower comes out as hi there. So this bit is part of all strings. Both variables and constants have these string functions built into them. And every instance of a string, whether it be a variable or constant, has these capabilities. They don't modify it. They just give you back a copy. Now, it turns out there is a, a command inside Python called dir to ask questions like, hey, well, here's, you know, stuff is it got hello world. We can say, oh, let me redo this. Come here. Stuff has a string. We can ask, hey, what are you? I am a string. Dir is another built-in Python that asks the question, hey, what are all the things that are built into this that I can make use of? And here they are. That's kind of a raw dump of them. You can also go look at the online documentation for Python and see at the, Pyth oops, at the Python website, you can see a whole bunch of these things, and they have the calling sequence, what the parameters are, etc. So when you're looking these things up, you can go, go read about them. Here's just a few that I pulled out. Capitalize, which uppercase is the first characters. Uh, center ends with find. There's stripping. So I'll look through a couple of these, just the kind of things to be looking for. Be a good idea to take a look and read through some of the things. Here's a couple that, that we'll probably be using early on. Um, the find function, it's similar to in, um, but it tells you where it finds the, the particular thing that it's looking for. And, um, and so we'll put fruit is banana. And I'm going to say pause, which is going to be an integer variable, equals fruit.findNA. So what it's saying is go look inside this variable fruit, hunt until you find the first occurrence of the string NA. Hunt, 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 hunt. Whoop, got it. And then return it to me. So that's going to give me back 2. 2 is where it found it, right? So where is it in the string? That's what find does. And if you don't find anything, like you're looking for a z, and no, 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 I didn't find the z, then it gives me back negative 1. So just, again, this is just one of many built-in functions in string. The ability to find a substring, okay? Or find, yeah, find a character or string within another string. There's a lowercase. There's also an uppercase. This might be better named shouting. Upper means give me an uppercase copy of this variable. So hello, Bob becomes hello, Bob. And then lower is hello, Bob. All right. So these are both ways to get copies of uppercase and lowercase versions. Uh, you might think these are kind of silly, but one of the things we tend to use lower for is if you're doing searching, and you want to ignore case, you convert the whole thing to lowercase, and then you search for a lowercase string. So you, 
depends if you want to ignore case or not. So that's, that's one of the reasons that you have things like this. There is a replace function. Again, it doesn't change the uh, value. Uh, greet is going to have hello Bob. And I'm going to say greet dot replace all occurrences of Bob with Jane. That gives me back a copy in nster says hello Jane. So, so greet is unchanged. This replace says make a copy and then make that following edit that you that that we requested. <clears throat> now we can also say, well, I mean the replace is going to do all occurrences. So greet is still hello Bob. This is kind of redundant here. I'm just doing it so you remember what it is. Greet is still hello Bob. I put hello Bob back in it and replace all the occurrences of lowercase o with uppercase x. And then that happens. So this says go through the whole string. Doing all those replacing. Okay? Now another common thing that we're going to have to do is we're going to have to uh, throw away white space. Sometimes you have a string that has characters, blank characters, or other characters at the beginning and the end, non-printable characters, and we can strip them. And there's three character, three functions that are built into to, uh, to Python strings that do this for us. There is lstrip, which strips from the left. There is R strip, which strips from the right, so throws away these white spaces, so hello Bob is gone. I mean, the so it gets rid of these characters. Oops, these are the ones that are gotten rid of there. I need an eraser. And then, well, let's use white. And then strip basically gets rid of all the white space, both on the left and the right side, and gets rid of that. So we're going we're gonna to be using these a lot. It, one of the things you tend to do in Python is cleaning up data. Sometimes if you have spaces at the beginning or the end, you just want to kind of ignore them. So you strip them off. You throw them away. When we're looking for data, we sometimes are looking for a prefix. And there is a starts with function <clears throat> that gives you a true or a false. We're asking here, does this variable line start with the string please? And the answer is true, because it does start with the string please. Or, and the next, we ask, does this start with the letter P? And the answer is false. It does not start with the letter P. Okay, so there's lots more of these things. And reading data and tearing it apart is one of the things that we're going to really focus on uh, for the rest of these first few chapters of the book. Okay, because that's one thing that Python's really good at. It's tearing data into pieces and pulling the pieces that you want. So, so let's take a look at this line. So this line that we've got here is a line from an actual email box. This is what, if you looked at your email sort of on your hard drive, email boxes would have this kind of a format. And there's actually many lines, and, and then soon we'll be reading whole files full of email. But for now, let's just say we've got this one line somehow. And we're looking for, we don't know how long these things are going to be, the first character, the first thing is from, then there's an email address, then there's some detail about when the mail was sent. But what we actually want is we want this part right here. And that's the domain name of the mail address, right? We want to extract this out. We're faced with this line in a variable, and we want to extract that out. So this is kind of putting all these things together. So let's walk through how we do this. So Here's this line, and it's a big long string. Mostly we would have read this from a file rather than just put it in a constant, but for now we put it in a constant because we files is the next chapter. And so what we're going to do is we're going to say, you know what, I'm going to look at this line and I'm going to go find the at sign. And I want to know where the at sign is. So I call data.find at sign and put the result in at pose. And that gives me 21. It hunts until it finds the at sign and then tells me where it found it. Then what I want to look at is starting here for the rest of the string I want to find the first space afterwards. So what I say is this sp pose is my variable for the position of the space data dot find a blank starting at the at. So this is starting at 21. So it says I'll start at 21 and I'll look for the next blank and I find that at 31. So now I know where the at sign is and I know where the space is. And so what I'm looking at is 
I want the stuff one beyond the at sign up to but not including the space. So then I can use a slicing operation. I can use a slicing operation. Start at the at position, add one to it, so we advance one, that's going to be the letter U, and then a slicing operation up to but not including space. Up to, this is going to work out nicely all of a sudden, but not including. Okay? And then I'm going to take that slice, which is really this little bit of data right here, take that slice and put it in the variable host. Then we print that out and we get the piece. Okay? And so here we have some data we want to tear apart. We hunt for the at. We find it at position 21. We start at 21 and we look for the, the space after that, 31. And then we pull from 22 up to, but not including 31. And it, it wouldn't matter where this thing was because these aren't all the same length when we start looking at them in files. But it would have found the at sign and the space after the at sign and it would have, it would have reliably pulled out the host. Okay? So this is a basic pattern we call parsing. Parsing text. Like find this, find that other thing, grab this thing out, then look inside that thing. And so it does all these things, right? So, so that's kind of strings. Up next we have files. Files are going to be lots of strings, so we're going to start putting all these things together. And, uh, and so the next chapter is a really, really important chapter where it starts to really start coming together. So uh, see you soon. Welcome to Chapter 7, Python for Informatics, Exploring Information. I'm Charles Severance. I'm the author of the book and your host. And as always, this is brought to you by, no, I'm sorry, uh, it's all creative copyright, creative commons attribution. The audio, the video, the slides and even the book. So here we go. Oh, and um, and so frankly, where we've been working all along is we have been writing code and talking to the CPU. Hang on, let me let me go get my CPU and stuff. Hang on, be right back. Okay, here we go, here we go. Here's all the stuff. Remember the stuff from the first lecture? Ah, there we go with that. Remember the motherboard from the first lecture? This is kind of a picture of what's on the screen. The motherboard, the CPU plugs in here, memory plugs in here. And remember how the CPU is sort of the brains, as much brains as there is for the operation. This CPU is asking what next. The instructions come in through these little pins. There's data inside, and it stores sort of semi-permanent data. Variables are all stored pretty much here in RAM. And we write our programs, and so your Python programs, they're sitting here in this RAM, and they're being fed to this CPU through those chips. Uh, through those pins, right? The pins. I mean, it doesn't really connect like that. And so, so frankly, up to now, everything that we've been doing is just the Python programming language. And so the only place we've really been operating is here. We have been putting Python into the main memory and the main memory, and we have been effectively feeding instructions to the CPU, the central processing unit, as it needed them. And then the program would stop. And everything we've done so far, everything, is just sort of fiddling around here. We have never escaped it. So now we are finally going to escape from the central processing unit and the memory. We'll still write programs and have variables in here. But now we are going to use the disk, the secondary storage, the permanent media. Right. So if I go grab my Raspberry Pi... All right, that just goes right there. Here's my Raspberry Pi. So here we got the Raspberry Pi, which is the small version, which of course has a CPU, memory, and graphics processor all on this little chip right here. But the secondary memory for the is this little SD card 
that is the secondary memory for Raspberry Pi. So the structure of the Raspberry Pi is exactly the same as the structure of any other personal computer. It's just smaller and less expensive. And so in the Raspberry Pi, if you're programming in the Raspberry Pi, you're sort of finally escaping. All your programs were in here, your CPU is in here, and that's pretty much how, how far you got to run. But now, of course, when you save your files, you save them to here. But now we are going to start looking at data on the disk drive. And so it's time to escape to the secondary memory. Okay? Time to escape to the secondary memory. There's a Raspberry Pi, you go right there. Okay? So it's time to find some data to mess with. So a lot of what we've doing, been doing so far is just kind of the pre-work to get to the point where we can do this. And in here we're going to have data files. Now we've been making data files. You've been writing every Python program that you write on your computer gets saved as a file then Python reads the file and runs it. But now we're actually going to start messing with some data. And so files are where we're going to be working with. And so the one of the things about secondary memory is it's much larger. I mean, this is main memory of the computer is pretty large. It's just not large enough to hold everything that the computer is capable of holding. So the files that we're going to work with. Now we're not talking about image files or QuickTime movies or things like that. We're going to work with text files because the theme of this course is digging through text. Sometimes we'll pull it off the internet, sometimes we'll read files, but it's digging through and using all the things that we've learned so far, looping and strings and all those things, to make sense of a sequence of information. Okay. Now, to access file information, we have to do this thing called opening the file. We can't just say, yo, the information is just omnipresent because there are so much data that you can't have Python sort of know all the data. You literally have hundreds of thousands of files on your computer's hard drive um, and you, which one are you going to read? So there's a step that you have to do that you call this built-in function called open and say, oh, this is the file I want to work with of the hundreds of thousands. And then once you do, you've kind of got this little connector into it. And uh, the open is a built-in function inside Python. Hang on a sec, let's say goodbye to that. The open function is a built-in function in Python. And you, it takes two parameters. The first parameter is the name of the file, like mbox.txt. And then the second is how you're going to read it. Are you going to read it? Are you going to write it? Etc. Now, most of the time, we'll be reading our files. So we call the open function and pass it in the name of the file we want to uh, open and then how we want to read it. Now, you can leave this second parameter off and it assumes that you're going to want to read the file. Now, when the open is successful, it doesn't actually read all of the data because the memory is small, small compared to the hard drive. And so you have to sort of step through the data. You'll tell it to, when to read it. So the act of opening it isn't not actually reading all the data. It is creating kind of like a connection between the memory and the data that's on the hard drive, right? It's connecting between, oh, let's do this. Oh, that's going to fall down. It's going to stand up that way. Oh, I should come up with a way to make that stand. Ah. So uh, it's a connection. So the, your program's kind of running in here, and the, and the file handle is just sort of a, it's like a phone call between your memory and your disk drive. It's not the actual data. The actual data is still sitting on the disk drive. Okay? So a graphical way to take a look at this is the file handle, the thing that comes back from the open request, the open goes and finds the file out on the disk drive, yada, yada, yada. And then the handle is something that lives in the memory that is sort of like the thing that maintains its connection to where all the data is on the disk or on the SD RAM that's in it. So the handle is not all the data, but it is a mechanism that you can use to get at the data. So if you print it out, it doesn't have all the data from the file. It says, I am a file handle. It's opened this file, and we're in read mode. So it doesn't actually have the data, even though this is the data that's in the file. And then we have operations that we do to the handle, like open it, close it, read it, write it. So we do things. To, so the handle, and then through the handle, it actually changes what's on the disk or read what's on, reads what's on the disk. So the handle is kind of a thing that's not there. 
if you attempt to open a file and the name of the file. Now the way we're going to do these is these need to be in the same folder on your computer as in uh, as your Python code. Now there are trickier ways to do it, but we're going to keep it simple. This is the name of a file in the same folder as the Python code that you're running. And uh, if it's not, then we get, of course, a traceback. And we're used to using reading tracebacks by now. No such file or directory stuff.txt. Oh, of course, I forgot to save it, or I typed it wrong. So, the next thing we have to learn is the notion of the new line character. We haven't seen this so far, but <clears throat> there's a special character in files that is used to indicate the end of a line. Because these text files that we've been writing, including the Python programs that you have, are organized into lines. Each line is variable length, and there's a special non-printing character that you just don't see. Now, you see it because you see a line, multiple lines, but you don't see the character itself. So, we'll, so it, it turns out that this character is very important because the data is just a stream of characters on disk and then it's punctuated by new lines that tell it when it's time to end the line. So um, if we're building a string, the constant for new line is backslash n. And so <clears throat> when we make a string that we want to have a new line in it, we'll say hello backslash n world. And then if you print it out one way, you actually see the backslash in. But then if you use the print to print it out, you see sort of like the it moves back down, you know, to, to the left margin and down. So so sometimes you see the slash in, and sometimes it's shown as movement, right? You move it moves it. The other thing that's important is even though we represent this as two characters, the backslash n is represented as two characters in a string, it's actually one character. So if we print it out, we see x, new line y. And if we ask how many characters are in stuff, which is this string, it says 3. That's important. Okay, There is 1, 2, 3. The new line is a single character. This is just a syntax that we use to sort of encode a new line in a string. Okay, So even though these are just a long sequence of characters punctuated by new lines, visually text editors and operating systems show them show these files to us as a sequence of lines. And after, it doesn't take very long to just start thinking about them as a sequence of lines. As a matter of fact, maybe you never wish I'd never told you about new lines. But when we start reading files, we're going to have to deal with these new lines. So the way that we sort of have to mentally visualize of what these text files look like is they have a new line that punctuates the end of the line. Now in reality, if we look at this, this R really comes right after it. right? This is all a bunch of characters and the new lines are punctuation. Okay, To say this is first line, second line, third line, fourth line. So you got to think that each of these things is here sitting at the end of the line. And so the number of characters in this line include that new line. Now the new line is one character. Okay, So how do we read these files? Well, we've already talked about doing an open X file. And I'm just this X file, again, that's just a mnemonic name that I made up. This is a handle. Remember, it's not all the data, but the handle is the way that we can read the data. We can use it as a access point. The coolest way to read a file, if it's a text file in multiple lines, is to use a determinant loop, a for loop. For cheese in X files. So this Remember, we would put a list of numbers or a string here. Now we've put a file handle here. Python knows automatically that each time we're going to run this loop, it's going to go to the next line of the file. Automatically. For, a cheese is just a stupid name that I came up with. It probably would be better to call it line rather than cheese. But for, cheese, in, and then it goes tut, 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 each file, and then stops when it reads the whole file. So this line will print out every line in the file. That's how you do it. These three lines open a file, read every line in the file. Okay. So a file handle itself is a special kind of a sequence, much like a list of numbers or a string is a sequence of characters. So one of the things we can do to combine one of our counting idioms is count the number of lines in a file. Okay. And so how we would do that is we would open the file set a counter to zero. This time I'll use a mnemonic variable called count. For line in f hand, that says 
run this indented text once for each line in the file. For each line in the file, add count equals count plus one. When the for loop is done, print the count. Pretty straightforward. Very few other languages are capable of writing that program in as quick and as dense, as succinct a way as Python is. Python does a really, really nice job of this. Okay, so that's how you count the lines. Open it, write a for loop, and then add one. Now, be, we can't just say, we, so what you can't do, and this gives you a sense, is you can't say len f hand. And that's because this isn't really the data. That's sort of, you have to like pull, the, pull it and read it to get the data out of it. Although we'll see another way of reading it later. Okay, so that's counting the lines in a file. It turns out you can also read the entire file. Now, if you read the entire file, it's not broken into lines. You're getting all the characters punctuated by new lines, and you get everything. Now, you don't want to read this if it's too big. So it's going to all try to read it into the memory of the computer. And if the memory is not big enough, the computer is going to slow down to a crawl. But if it's a real tiny file, this works just fine. And so, so we have sort of real, uh, we open a file, and we say fhand.read. This is basically saying, hey, dear fhand, read it all and return it to me as a string. So that's a string with all the lines of the file concatenated together with new lines, which is actually exactly what's in the file. It's the raw data. That for loop sort of looks for the new line and does all the stuff automatically for us. That's quite nice. So then we can, like, because imp is a string at this point, we can just print the length of it. And we can say, oh, there's 94,626 characters that came from that file. It reads the whole thing, whole file, reads the whole file. We can also do things like, you know, slice it now. And so this is the first 20 characters up from 0 up to, but not including 20. So this is, this is our file, okay? So that's reading through the whole file. So let me go back a little bit. This is the file that we're going to play with. This file here that we're going to play with in this class is a mailbox file. And this is actual real data, and these are real people, and these are real dates having to do with an open source project that I worked on called Sakai. I actually have a tattoo of Sakai here on my shoulder. Uh, maybe in an upcoming lecture I'll have a short sleeve shirt and show you my tattoo. But for now I can't because I've got, I got my clothes on. So, um, but this is real data. It's the mbox.txt mbox.txt file. So, so that's the file that we're going to use for most of the next few assignments. It'll be the same file. You'll get tired of it. And you get to know all these people, Steven and Chen Wen and all the people in the file. Okay, so we can search for lines that have a prefix. This is kind of the find pattern from the uh, looping lecture. So we're going to go through a list of, of lines in a file, and we're going to only print out the ones that match a certain thing. So again, we open the file up. We're going to write a for loop that's going to say for each line in the file, if the line, and then we can call a, a, a utility function inside of string, because line is a string. If line starts with from, print it out. So this means it's going to loop through all of the lines of the file, and it's going to print the ones that start with a string from colon. Okay. Again, four lines, complete Python program to read this file and print the lines that have a prefix of from. So if you run this program, and I suggest that you do, this is what the output's going to look like. And it's like, wait a second. I'm seeing the lines, seeing the lines that have the froms. But then I get these blank lines. And why is that? Why are these blank lines there? If I look at the program, I mean, I'm not printing blank lines. I'm only printing lines that start with from. I'm not doing that. So why? What do you think? I'll give you a second. I've certainly done enough foreshadowing in this lecture. Well, it turns out these new lines are the problem. So it turns out that the print, we've been doing this all along. You just didn't, we didn't make a fuss about it. The print adds a new line at the end of everything that it prints. So these yellow new lines are coming from the print statement. But when we read the file, each line ends in a new line. So these green new lines are actually from the file. 
They're the ones from the file. So what's happening is we're seeing two new lines, and so that turns in to a blank line. So how do we deal with that? Well, we've got a string function that conveniently solves that problem. Okay? And that is we're going to call rstrip. If you recall, we had strip, lstrip, and rstrip to strip white space on one side, on the other side, or on both sides. So in this one, we're going to use rstrip. We're going to say, we're going to read the line, that this line is going to have a new line in it. rstrip says pull white space, and the new lines are also counted as white space. Blanks or new lines are white space. And then we're going to replace this with no new line in it. Then we're going to ask if it starts with a from, and then we're going to print it out. And then we go and we're going to see exactly what we're looking for in this file. And there's no new lines. Now there, so the new line that's coming out here is the one from the print, not the one from the file, because the one from the file got wiped out by that particular line. Okay? So another general pattern of these file-based loops that we um, have done this is a skipping pattern. Now you can do the non-skipping pattern is where you're saying I'm going to look for lines that start with from and do something to them. Sometimes you want to do something to all to to the uh, to, to you want to say here's a bunch of lines I'm going to skip and then I'm going to do something. So the skipping pattern uses continue. And so the first few lines here are the same. We open a file, we read each line in the file, then we're going to strip off the white space. You're going to get tired of typing these three lines because you're going to do it a lot. Open the file, start reading the file, strip the white space for each line. And you can make it so that you can look for some fact. In this case, I'm going to say if not line starts with from, means this is true for all the lines that don't start with from, continue. And if you remember, continue goes up. So the continue says, I'm done. It finishes the iteration, and it doesn't do anything down here. Okay, and so it, this is, a, and then we can do something. So I've kind of flipped this where I said, these are the things I'm interesting, interested in. That's lines that start with from. So I'm going to skip the lines that don't. So I'm going to use continue. Either way, you can do it, depending on the complexity or how much. Often, when you're, this is a good pattern when you have lots of lines of code down here that you're going to do a lot of cool stuff with. You can also use things like in to select lines, right? So I'm going to I'm going to look for lines that have at uct.ac.za in them. So again, I'm going to open it up. I'm going to open these go through each line in the file. I'm going to strip the white space out and <clears throat> if not uct if this if this string is not in line, then I'm going to continue. So it's a way for me to skip all of the lines that don't have this string in it. So these lines do, oops, that's what that one has it too. And then we're going to print it out. It will print out the ones that make it past here. Okay, so, but in is another way to do searching. I had starts with, etc. So one more thing that you might want to try is, um, <clears throat> so we can count, right? Now, and this is a pattern for uh, prompting for a file name. And so... So here you'll you'll get tired of sort of changing your code every time you want to open a different file because you probably want to run the program with inbox once and inbox short because you just just so you can test it with different things of data. So here's just another pattern. We add this line to say raw input enter the file name and there you go. We'll type in the file name and then the thing that we open is whatever we entered as the file name and then the rest of it is pretty much yada yada. So here I'm uh, it's reading the whole file. If the line starts with subject, count equals count plus one. And then there were 1797 subject lines in inbox.txt. There were 27 subject lines in inbox short.txt. Okay, so that's prompting for the file names. Now, open, the open statement fails if the file name doesn't exist. So you might want to add a try and accept around that. If you want to if you're just writing code for yourself and you assume that it is okay, then you don't have to write try accept. But if you want to catch it and catch a bad file name, then you take the open which is, and turn it into these four lines. So this is the code that we think might blow up. And it's going to blow up. We know it's going to blow up. If they enter a bad file name like 
Nana Boo Boo, right? This is going to blow up. So what do we do? We use try and accept. We put try around that. We're going to take out some insurance on that particular line. And then if it fails, we're going to print this message and then say exit to get out. So if you get a good file, if you get a good file, it works, skips the accept, then runs the thing, prints out the count. That's what's happening here. If, on the other hand, you get a bad file, it comes here, open blows up, runs the accept, prints this out, and then quits. So that's how this one works with a bad file. And now we know traceback, right? So we are, it's kind of a short lecture. We're done with chapter seven. We open a file. We read the file. We take out white space at the end with R strip. We have, use string functions. So this is kind of putting it all together. And it's kind of short little programs now. And so it's not, and uh, you know, starting now, we're going to start putting these things together and start actually doing work. Because now we have, from the first few chapters, we have basic capabilities of Python. Now we have some data to work with. Now going forward, we're going to do increasingly sophisticated things with that data. So I can't wait to see you in the next lecture. Hello, and welcome to Chapter 8, Python Lists. So now we're sort of going to start taking care of business. We are doing to make lists and dictionaries and tuples and really start manipulating this data and doing real data analysis, starting the laying the ground for work for real data analysis. As always, these lectures, audio, video, slides, and even book are copyright Creative Commons attribution. So lists, dictionaries, and tuples, the next real three big topics we're going to talk about are collections. And uh, we've been doing lists already, right? Um, we've been doing uh, lists when we were doing for loops. Uh, a list in Python is something that has a square braces. This is a constant list. Now, when I first talked to you about variables, I sort of oversimplified things. I said if you put like x equals 2 and then put x equals 4, the 2 and the 4 overwrite each other. A collection is where you can put a bunch of things in the same variable. Now, I have to find, have a way to find those things. Um, but it, it, it allows us to put multiple things in more, it, more things, more than one thing in a variable. And so here we have friends that has three strings, Joseph, Glenn, and Sally. And we have carry on that has socks, shirt, and perfume. So that's the basic idea. So what's not a collection? Well, simple variables. Simple variables are not collections. Just like this example, I say x equals 2, x equals 4, and print x. And the 4 is in there, and the 2 is somehow gone. It was there for a moment, and then it's gone. And so that's a normal variable. They're not collections. You can't put more than one thing in it. But when you put more than one thing in it, then you have to have a way to find the things that are in there. We'll, we'll get to that. So we've been using list constants for the last couple of chapters just because we have to use list constants. You know, So we used uh, in the for loop chapter, we did lists of numbers. We have done lists of strings. That's strings, red, yellow, and blue. And you don't have to necessarily, um, you don't necessarily have to have things all of the same type. This is a three item list that has a string red, a the number integer 24, and 98.6, which is a floating point number. Here's an interesting thing, just as a side note. This shows that floating point numbers are not always perfectly represented inside of the computer. It's sort of an artifact of how they work. And this is an example of 98.6 is really 98.9999. So that don't, when you see something like that, don't freak out. Floating point numbers are the ones that show this behavior. So interestingly, you can always, although we won't put a lot of energy into this, you can also have an element of a list be a list itself. So this is an outer list that's got three elements, one, seven, and then a list that's five and six. So if you look at the length of this, there is three things in it, not four, three, because the outer list has one, two, three things in it. And an empty list is bracket, bracket. Okay? Like I said, we have been going through lists all along. We have iteration variables, for i in. This is a list. We've been using it all along. 
Similarly, we've been using lists in indefinite loops are a great way to go through lists for friend in friends. There we have goes through three times, out come three lines with the variable friend advancing through the three successive items in the list, and away we go. So again, lists are not completely foreign to us. Now, just like in a string, we can use the index operator, the square bracket operator, and we can look up items in the list. Sub 1, friends sub 1. Not surprisingly, using the European elevator rule, the first item in a list is sub 0. The second item is sub 1, and the third one is sub 2. So here when I print friends sub 1, I get Glenn, which is the second element, just like strings. So once you kind of know it for strings, lists and the rest of these things make a lot more sense. Just remember that we're in Europe and things start with zero. Some things in these data items that we work with are not mutable. So for example, strings. When we ask for a lowercase version of a string, we're given a copy of that string. And that's because strings are not mutable. And we can see this by doing something like saying fruit sub zero equals lowercase b. Now you'd think, that that would just change this to be a lowercase b, but it doesn't. Okay, it says string object does not support item assignment, which means that you're not allowed to reassign. You can make a new string and put different things in that new string, but once the strings are made, they're not changeable, and that's why when we call fruit dot lower, we get a copy of it in lowercase, and so x is a copy of the original string, but the original string once we assign it into fruit is unchanged, can't be changed. This, on the other hand, can be changed, and we can change them in the middle. This is one of the things we like about them. So here we have a list, 2, 14, 26, 41, and 63. Then we say lotto sub 2. Of course, that is going to be the third item. Lotto sub 2 is equal to 28. Then we print it, and we see the new number there. So all this is saying is that we can change them, right? Strings, no, and lists, yes. You can change lists, but you can't change strings. So, the len function, we've used it for several things. We can say, you know, use, len is used for, for strings, and it's used for lists as well. So the same function knows that when its parameter is a string, and when its parameter is a string, it gives us the number of characters in the string, and when it is a list, it gives us the number of elements in the list. And just because one of them is a string, it's still one element from the point of view of this list. So it has one, two, three, four, four items in the list. Okay? So the range function is a special function. It's probably about time to talk about the range function. The range function is a function that generates a list, that produces a list and give it back, gives it back to us. And so you give the range function a parameter how many items you want, and the range function creates and gives us back a list that is four numbers starting at zero, which is zero up to but not including three. Sound familiar? Yeah, zero up to but not, I mean, zero up to but not including four. And, and so the same thing is true here. So we can combine the len and the range to say, you know, to, to say, okay, well, len friends, that's three items and range len friends is 0, 1, 2. And it also corresponds exactly to these items. So we can actually use this to construct loops to go through a list. We already have a basic for loop, right? We basically have a for loop that is our the the set the for each friend in friends and out comes Happy New Year, Glenn and Joseph. If we also want to know where, what position we're at as the loop progresses, we can rewrite the exact same loop a different way and make i be our iteration variable and say i in range len friends, that turns this into 0, 1, 2, and then i goes 0, 1, 2, and then we can in the loop look up the particular friend that is the particular one we're interested in using the index operator, friends sub i, and then print Happy New Year. So these two loops, these two loops are equivalent. These, oop, not that one. This loop and this loop. 
This loop is preferred unless you happen to need this value i, which tells you where you're at, in case maybe you're going to change something. You're going to look through something and then change it. So, but, but for what I've written here, they're exactly equivalent. Prefer the simpler one unless you need the more complex one. They both produce the same kind of output. We can concatenate lists much like we concatenate strings with a plus. And you can think of the Python operators looking to its right and to its left and saying, oh, those are both lists. I know what to do with lists. I'm going to put those together. And so that produces a two, three long list become a six long list with the first one followed by the second one concatenated. It didn't hurt the original. A, C is a new list, basically. We can also slice lists. Feels a lot like strings, right? Everything's kind of like strings. For loops like strings, concatenation like strings, and now slicing like strings. And it is exactly the same. So one up to but not including. Just remember, up to but not including. The second parameter is up to but not including. So that starts at the sub one, which is the second one, up to but not including three, the third one. So this is one, two, and three. So that's 41 comma 2. Starting at the first one, up to but not including the third one. We can similarly eliminate the first one. So that's up to but not including the fourth one. Zzz, starting at 0, 1, 2, 3, but not including 4. So that's this one. If we go 3 to the end, and again remember that they're starting at 0, so 3 to the end is 0, 1, 2, 3 to the end. The number 3 doesn't matter. So that's 3, 74, 15. And the whole thing. That's the whole thing. So these two things are the same. So slicing works like strings. Starting and up to but not including is the second parameter. There are some methods, and you can read about these online uh, in the Python documentation. We can use the built-in function. It doesn't have a lot of use in... Uh, sort of how we run when we're running programs but it's kind of useful I like it when I'm typing interactively like what can this thing do so I make a list list is a unique type and I say with dir I say what can we do with it well we can append we can count extend index insert pop remove reverse and sort and then you can sort of read up on all these things um, I'll show you just a couple um, we can build a list with the append so this syntax here stuff equals list that's called a constructor, which says, give me an empty list. You could also say bracket, bracket for an empty list. Whatever, you got to make an empty list. And then you call the append. Remember that lists are mutable, so it's okay to change it. So we're saying, okay, we started with an empty list. Now append to the end of that, the word book, and then append to that, 99. Wait a sec, that's a mistake. That's a mistake. So I have to fix this mistake. So watch me fix the mistake. Poof. Now my thing is magically fixed. Isn't that amazing? I have magic powers when it comes to slide fixing. I just snap my uh, fingers and the slides are fixed. So here we go. We append a 99 and we print it out and it's got book and 99, emphasizing the fact that they don't have to be the exact same kind of thing in a list. Then later we append cookie and then it's book 99 cookie. Okay, so this append, we won't do it in line like this so often. We'll tend to do it in a loop as we're building up a list. But that's a way you start with an empty list and then ch -ch 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 programmatically grow it. We can ask, much like we do in a string, we can ask if an item is in a list. So here's a list called sum with these numbers in it. It's got five numbers in it. Is nine in sum? True. Yes, it is. Is 15 in sum? False. Is 20 not in, that's a, le a legal syntax, that is legal syntax. Is 20 not in sum? Yes, it's not there. Okay, they don't modify the list. Don't modify the list, they're just asking questions. These are logical operations, often used in if statements or while, some kind of a logic that you might be building. Okay, so... Uh, Lists have order. So when we were appending them, the first thing went in first, the second thing went in second, etc., etc. And we can also tell the list to sort itself. 
So one of the things that we can do with a list, now we're starting to see some power here, is say sort yourself. This is a list of strings. It can sort numbers. It can sort lots of things. Friends.sort. That says, hey there, dear friends, sort yourself. This makes a change. It alters the list and puts it in this case in alphabetical order. Glenn, Joseph, and Sally. It is muted. It was, it's, it's been modified. And so friend sub one is now Joseph because that's the second one. Okay? So the sort method says sort yourself. Now, sort yourself. And it sorts and then it stays sorted. So <clears throat> you're going to be kind of ticked about this particular slide because there's a whole bunch of built in functions that help with lists. And um, there's max, there's min, there's len, various things. And so we could, all those loops that I told you how to do, I was just showing you that stuff because I thought it was important. Um, this is the simplest way to go through and find the largest, smallest, and uh, sum, etc. So here's a list of numbers. We can say how many are there. That's the count. We can say what's the largest. It's 74. What's the smallest? That'd be 3. What is the sum of the running total of them all? 154. If you remember from a few lectures ago, these are the same numbers. And what is the average? Which is sum of them over the length of them. Okay. So this makes a lot more sense. And if you had a list of numbers like this, you would simply say, what's the max? You wouldn't write a max loop. I just did that to kind of demonstrate how loops work. <clears throat> demonstrate how loops work. So here is a way that you can sort of change those kind of programs that we wrote. So there's two ways to write a summing program. Let's just say instead of the data being in a list, we're going to write a while loop that's going to read a set of numbers until we say done and then compute the average of those numbers. Okay, so let's say this is our problem. Read a list of numbers, wait till the word done comes in, and then average them. So here's a little program that does that. We create total equals zero, count equals zero, make a infinite loop with while true, and then we ask to enter a number. We get a string back from this. Remember, raw input always gives us strings back. And then if it's done, we're going to break. This is the version of the if that does not require an indent. We just put the break up there. And so that gets us out of the loop when the time is right. So when the time is right over here. And then we convert the value to float. We use float to convert the input to a floating point number. And then we do our accumulation pattern. Total equals total plus value. Count equals count plus one. So this is going to run. These numbers are going to go up and up and up and up. And then we're going to break out of it calculate the average, and then print the average. Because that's a floating point number, so now the average is a floating point number. So that's one way to do it, right? That would be one way to write a program that does an average, is keep a running average as you're reading the numbers. But there's another way to do it that would exact work exactly the same way. And this is when you can start using lists. So come in, you say, I'm going to make a list of numbers just a mnemonic name, numList, is an empty list. Then I create another infinite loop that's going to read for enter a number. And if it's done break, that kind of gets us out of it. Convert the value to an imp. Uh, convert the, the value to a float, the input value to a float. And then append it to the list. So now the list is going to grow. Each time we read a number, the list is going to grow. However many times we add the numbers, how many things are going to be in the list. So in this case, when we're at this point and we type done, there will be three numbers in the list because we will have run append three times. We'll have appended three, nine, and five. We'll have them sitting in a list, and we will have exited the loop. So now you say, oh, add up all the numbers in that list, and then divide it by the length of the list, and print the average. So these two programs are basically equivalent. The only time that they might not be equivalent was if there was... 10 million numbers, this would use up 40 megabytes of your memory, which is actually not a lot of memory on some computers, but if memory mattered, there, this does store all those numbers. This one actually just runs the calculation. So if there's a really large number of, of numbers, this would make a difference because the list is growing and keeping them all, summing them all at the end. This is actually storing very little data. 
but for reasonably sized numbers, like thousands or even hundreds of thousands of numbers, these two approaches are kind of equivalent. And then sometimes you actually want to accumulate something a little more complex than this. You want to sort them or look for the maximum and look for something else. Who knows what? But the notion of make a list and then append something to the list each time through the iteration and then do something with a list at the end is a rather powerful pattern. So this is also a pa powerful pattern. This is the accumulator pattern where we just have the variables accumulating in the loop. This one is one where we accumulate the data in the loop and then do the computations all at the end. De certain situations will make use of these different techniques. Okay, so connecting strings and lists. So there's a method, a capability of strings that is really powerful when it comes to tearing data apart. It's called the split. So here is a string with three words and has blanks in between here. And abc.split says parse this string, look for the blanks, break the string into pieces and give me back a list with one item for each of the words in the list as defined by the spaces. Okay, so it takes, breaks it into three pieces and gives us that back in a list. It's very powerful. Okay, so we're going to split it and we get it back a list. There are three words and the first word, stuff sub zero, is with. So there's a lot of parsing going on here. We could do this with for loops and a lot of other things. There would be a lot of work in this split. Given that this is a really common task, it's really great that this has been put into Python for us. Okay? So split breaks a string into parts and produce a list of strings. We think of these as words. We can access a particular word or we can loop through all the words. So here we have stuff again and now we have a, a for loop for each of the that's going to go through each of the three words and then it's going to run three times. Now chances are good we're going to do something different other than just print them out. But you see how that you quickly can take a split followed by a for and then write a loop that's going to go through each of the words without working too hard to find the spaces. You let Python do all the hard work of finding the spaces. Okay? So let's take a look at a couple of samples. Um, just a couple things to teach you a little more about split. Uh, split looks at many spaces as equal to one space. So if you split a lot blank, 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 of spaces, it still just throws away all those spaces and gives us four words. One, two, three, four, and throws away all the spaces because it assumes that's what we want done. So that's nice. You can also have split you can also have split split on some other character. Sometimes you'll be getting data and they'll have used a semicolon or a comma or a colon or a tab character. Who knows what they've used and your job is to dig that data out. So you can split based on a different character. Here, if we're splitting normally with, with this is a normal split, it's not going to see the semicolons. It's looking for a space and so all we get back is one item in the string with the semicolons. But if we switch and we pass semicolon as a parameter to, in as a parameter to split, then it will know to split it based on semicolons and gives us first, second, and third back. Okay, and then it gives us three words. So you can split either on spaces or you can split on a character other than a space. Okay, <clears throat> so let's take a look at how we might turn this into some of our common assignments that we have in this chapter where we're going to read some of the mailbox data. Okay. So here we go with a little program. First three lines, we write these a lot. Open the file, write a for loop to loop through each line in the file. Then we're going to strip off the white space at the end of the line. One, two, three. Do those all the time. And we're looking for lines, if you look at the whole file, we're looking at lines that start with from followed by a space. So if the line does not start with from followed by a space, that's a space right there, continue. So that's a way to skip all the lines that don't look like this. There are thousands of lines in this file and just a few that look like this. Okay, And so we're going to look and we're going to try to find 
what day of the week this thing happened on. So, so we're throwing away all the lines with this little bit of code. Then what we do is we take the line, which is all of this text, and then we split it. And we know that the day of the week is word sub 2. So this is word sub 0, this is word sub 1, and this is word sub 2. So this is word sub 0, sub 1, and sub 2. And so all we have to do is print out the sub 2, and we get, we throw away all the lines except the from lines, we split them and take the, sec, uh, the, the, the third word, or word sub 2, and we can quickly create something that's extracting the day of the week out of these. Okay? So it's, it's I mean, it's quick, because split does the tricky work. If you go back to the strings chapter, you saw that we did a lot of work to get this to happen. So here's even another tricky pattern. So let's say we want to do what we did at the end of chapter 6, the string chapter. Let's say we wanted to get back this little bit of data. Okay? So we can look at this and say, okay, let's split this, and this will be 0, 1, and 2, and 3, and 4, 5, and 6. We're splitting it based on spaces. Then the email address is <coughs> words sub 1, right? So that email address is this little bit of stuff because it's in between spaces, right? So that's what we pull out. The email address is word sub 1. We've got that. So that's sitting in this email address variable. Then we really, all we want, we don't really want the whole thing, we just want the part after the at sign. And we could do a look up for the, oh, we could do a look up of the at sign. But you can also then do a second, come back, come back. Zoop, there we come. You can also do a second split. Okay, so we're taking this variable here, email, which is merely this little part right here and we are splitting it again, except this time we're splitting it based on an at sign, which means it's going to bust it right here and find us two pieces. So pieces now is a list where the sub zero item is the person's name and the sub one item is the host that their mail address is held from. Okay, And so then all we need to know is pieces sub one and pieces sub one is this guy right here. So that's pieces sub 1, and so we pulled it out. So if you go back to how we did it before, we were doing searching, and we were searching some more, and then we're taking slices. This is a little more elegant, okay? Because really, we split it, and then we split it, and we knew what piece we were looking at. So this is what I call the double split pattern, where you split a string into a list, then you take a thing out, and then you split it again depending on what data you're looking for. This is just a technique. It's not the only technique. Okay, so that's lists. We talked about the concept of a collection where lists have multiple things in it, indefinite loops. Again, we've seen these things. We're kind of, it looks a lot like strings, except the elements are more powerful and they're more mutable. We still use the bracket operator and we redid the max, min, and sum except we did it in like one line rather than a whole loop. And, uh, and something we're going to play with a lot is using split to parse strings, the single split, and then the double split is a natural extension of the single split. So see you in the next lecture. Looking forward to talking about dictionaries. Hello, and welcome to Chapter 10 of Python for Informatics, the chapter on tuples. I'm Charles Severance. I'm your lecturer, and I'm the author of the textbook. As always, this material is copyright, Creative Commons attribution including the video lectures, the slides, uh, and the book. So tuples are the third kind of collection that we've talked about. We've talked about lists, and we've talked about dictionaries, and in the dictionary lecture we kind of alluded to tuples. Um, we don't have to talk too much about tuples, really shortening the lecture by telling you that they're a lot like lists. They're a non-changeable they're a non-changeable list. And, uh, and, and the syntax of, of them is pretty much the same as a list, except that we use parentheses instead of square, square brackets, okay? And so, like, here is a, a three-tuple, tuple with three items in it, Glenn, Sally, and Joseph. 
they are numbered 0, 0, 1, and 2, so the second thing is 1. So x sub 2 is indeed Joseph. Um, you know, we can pass them in as sequences to things like max or min or sum. Um, and so the maximum of 1, 9, 2 is 9. Um, and we can loop through them. So here is why it's a tuple. It's uh, 1, 9, 2. And iteration is going to go through the three, three values, right? And so it's going to print out 192. It runs the indented code once for each of the values inside the tuple. And so in this respect, they're very much like lists. But they're also different than lists in some uh, real valuable ways. Tuples are immutable. And so if you recall when we talked about lists, we compared them to strings because both lists and strings are a sequence of elements where the first one is 0, 1, 2, etc. But if we, if we look at a string, for example, and we have a three-character string, A, B, C, and we want to change the third character, Y sub 2, to D, it complains and says, no, you can't do that. But you can do it on a list. So if we have a list 9, 8, 7, and we say X sub 2 is 6, which is the third item, then the third item changes from 7 to 6. Okay, so this is mutable. This is not mutable. And tuples are also like not are not mutable. They are like strings. They're sort of like lists in terms of what they can store, but they're like strings in the fact that they can't be changed. So here we create a three tuple, a three item tuple, and we try to change the third thing from three to zero, and it says you can't do that. Not mutable. Okay? So so it's it's kind of like lists in the kind of data that we store them store in them, and it's kind of like strings in that you can't change them once you create them. So this parenthesis, this constant, is the moment of creation. Once you've put the things in, you can't fiddle around with it. There's a bunch of other things you can't do with tuples. You think, why am I even, why even use tuples? We'll get to that in a second. So here is a three tuple with the numbers 3, 2, 1. You can't sort it, because if you sorted it, that would change it. You can't add to it. You can't append the value 5 to the end of it because that would change it. And you can't reverse it. So none of these are allowed. Those are things you can do with lists, but you can't do with tuples. And you can read a documentation, but we can also use that built-in dir function, that really awesome dir function, where we make a list and we say, hey, Python, what will you let me do with lists? Well, you can append, count, extend, index, insert, sort, reverse, remove, pop. Lots of things. Now we make a tuple and say, hey Python, what can we do with cup tuple? Well, you can do a count or an index, which means you can't do all these other things. So this is sort of a, a very much a reduction. Because everything you can do with tuples you can do with lists, but not everything you can do with lists you can do with tuples. So why? Why did I just waste all this time introducing tuples? All the R's have parentheses. What good are they? Well, it turns out that they're much more efficient because Python doesn't have to deal with the fact that we as programmers might change them. Python can make them quicker, they can use less memory, all kinds of things that save a lot of processing time in Python. So when would you use a tuple? Well, in particular, if you're going to create some list that you're never changing, we prefer to use tuples. And there's a lot of situations in programming where we create what we think of as a temporary variable. And if we're going to use, create it, use it, and throw it away without ever modifying it, we prefer tuples in those kinds of situations. Okay, so we prefer tuples when we create things that are just temporary. It's the, it's the fact that they're temporary variables. They're like temporary lists because they're efficient. They're quick to make, and they're quick to get rid of, and they're quick to go through. Now, another really neat thing about Python that I really like is the fact that you can do sort of two assignments in one by putting an a tuple on both the left and the right hand side of the assignment statement. So if we think about an assignment statement, I like to think of it as having a direction that says these things go there. Well, in Python, you can actually send two things at the same time. The 4 goes into the x and the fred goes into the y. This is a tuple. This is a tuple. You, you cannot have constants on this left hand side. You can have variables or constants on the, or expressions on the right hand side but this must be two variables. Similarly, in this, the 99 goes into A and the 98 goes into B. 
Now, it turns out that you can syntactically eliminate the parentheses if you really want. And so this leads to a prettier syntax, I think. It's the exact same thing with or without parentheses, where we basically just say, hey, come back. A and B are assigned to the tuple 99, 98. And so you can eliminate the parentheses as long as it's very clear what's going on in the tuple. And so it, this, this might be a little disquieting when you first see it, but it's just a tuple with no parentheses, and the 99 goes to the A and the 98 goes to the B. Now, it turns out we already did this. I sort of blew by this in the previous lecture in dictionaries because it allows us to go through the dictionaries, keys, and values with two iteration variables. And so if you remember, here's a dictionary. We put two items into it. And, um, and we can call d.items and get a list of tuples, a list of two tuples. Two tuples are a quick way of saying a tuple with two things in it. It's a two-element list that consists each element is a two-tuple. And it's the key and the value, key and the value. And so if we just print this out, it's a list. So then when we put this on a for loop, it is a list, but the things inside the list are each a tuple. Each thing inside the list is a tuple. So when this iteration variable goes to there, it is like this tuple is being assigned into KV, which means the key, key goes into K and the value goes into V. The name I picked for K and V don't matter, do not matter. Um, it's, just, it's just the first one and the second one. So K, go, K and V point here, then the next time through the loop, K and V point here. And so that's how Chen two, uh, CSEV2 and Chen Wen uh, 4 happen. And so this is really a tuple assignment or a tuple iterating through a list of a tuple uh, iteration variable or a pair of iteration variables walking through the list. Okay. We don't do this a lot in this, it's really quite, it's most heavily used for this situation where you're going through a dictionary and you want to see both the keys and the values, and then you use this method inside of dictionary called D items. Another thing that's cool about tuples are that they're comparable. So less than, greater than, equals. And so they look, they first compare the first leftmost thing. And if that matches, they go to the second one. And then that one matches, they go to the third one. And so if we're asking, is 0, 1, 2 less than 5, 1, 2? And the answer is true. And it only looks at the 0 and the 5, and that's less than, so away we go. If we ask, is 0, 1, 2 million less than 0, 3, 4? Well, 0 and 0 match, so it goes to the second one. 1 and 3, well, they don't match, and they're less than, so 1 is less than 3. So it so it's true, and it doesn't even look at these numbers because it doesn't have to, right? In this one, it doesn't look at those numbers. And now if we say, come here, is Jones Sally less than Jones Fred? Well, it compares the this, and they're equal, so then it has to look to the second one. Is Sally less than Fred? Well, no, because S is not less than F, and so that answer is false. Is Jones Sally greater than Adams, Sam, well, Jones is greater than Adams, so it never looks at these variables, and that turns out to be true. So these are comparable, which means we can use the less than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, equal to, or not equal to. So we can use these operators on whole tuples. Now this turns out to be quite nice, because things that can be compared can also be sorted. Okay, So here is <clears throat> A, B, and C. A maps to 10, B maps to 1, C maps to 22. If I look at the items, I get back a list of two tuples, three two tuples. They are not sorted because dictionaries aren't sorted. A maps to 10, C maps to 22, and B maps to 1. The order that these come out in is not something that we can control. But if we put these items into a variable, call it t, t is the list of tuples basically, and then we tell it to sort, it can do comparisons between all these 
and it can sort them and now they're sorted in key order a b c now you'll never get any keys that match so it never looks at the second one right because there's one and only one key a or b or c the value 10 never gets looked at so this ends up sort by keys sort by keys okay so this is a way to sort by keys we take a dictionary we get back a list of tuples key value tuples then we sort that dictionary I mean sort that list of key value tuples and then it's sorted by key okay so that's one sort there is a built-in function in Python called sorted which takes as a parameter a list and gives you back a sorted version of that list so we can collapse these operations by saying oh well d sub items is this list of tuples non sorted but sorted of d sub items is that same list of tuples but then sorted so immediately in one step we have a b and c properly sorted and we can combine all this into one nice little for statement where we say 4kv in sorted of d sub items. So this is now going to first sort the key value pairs by key, and then kv is going to run through them. So k is going to be a, 10, then it's going to, k is going to be b, v is going to be 1, k is going to be c, v is going to be 22. So now we've printed these things out in alphabetical key order, okay? So by adding sorted to D items, that means that this loop is going to run in key sorted order. Key sorted order. And that's because sorted takes a list and then returns, as it takes a list as unsorted list as input, and returns a sorted list. Okay? Now, if we're doing something like our common problem of what's the most common word, what if we want to say what's the five most common words? In that case, we probably want to sort in descending order by the values, not the key. Okay? So we want to sort by the values instead of the key. So this is a situation where we're going to create a temporary variable. So here's how we're going to do it. Here is our dictionary with a10 and we want to sort now by the values we want to you know maybe see the most common or sort by the values and so we're going to make a temporary list and then we're going to loop through the items so so this is going to just loop through them and it's going to loop through them in non-sorted order and we're going to add using the append operation to this little list that we're making but we're going to add the, a tuple that is value comma key. So if we make the value first and the key second in this tuple. So this syntax here of this parenthesis v comma k, that means make a two tuple with values from the v and k variable. And append a list. So you're going to end up with a list of two tuples. So if we, if we take a look, when we're all done with this, each of these is a tuple. 10a gets appended. 22c gets appended and it was simply the opposite order the, the tuple each of the tuples now has the value first and the key second value first key second value first key second so this is a bit of temporary data that we've created this bit of temporary data that we've created then what we do is we call the sort method sort take this list lists are mutable the individual tuples can't be changed but the order of the tuples can be changed because they are in a list. temp.sort, and then we're going to say reverse equals true, so we sort from the highest down to the lowest. Okay? And now temp has been sorted, and now it is in a new order. 22, 10, 1 is what caused it to be sorted, so we know that the biggest value is 22, the key of C. Next biggest is 10 with a key of A and the smallest is a key of one, a value of 1 with a key of B. So the trick here is if we want to sort in some other way, we just construct a list where we put it in the order that we want it sorted, and this is more important now. The value is more important than the key. Now if we had um, another, like a, a 22F, 
it would sort first on the 22, and then it would, it would sort the F1 after the C1, right? So we don't have any duplicates, but we could have this, um, we could have the key of C to 22, and we could have F also to 22. Okay, so take some time on this, get this one right. So now I want to show you a program that is going to show you the 10 most common words. We did a, a loop before where we did the <clears throat> most common word by doing a maximum loop at the end by looking through all of the counts in a dictionary and then picking the maximum. But what if you wanted the top 10, right? That, that, you don't want to write a loop for that. So we're going to use sorting. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to open a file. We're going to create a empty counts dictionary. Then we're going to write a for loop that reads each line, for line in F hand. Then I'm going to split each line into words based on the spaces using the dot split. Then I'm going to loop through each word in each line and use our histogram or a, a dictionary pattern where I say count sub word equals counts dot get word comma zero. That basically says go look in counts. If word if the word key exists, give me back the value that's in that. Otherwise, give me zero. So this both creates the new entries and updates old entries all in one nice simple statement. So at the end of this bit of code right here, we are going to have counts with keyword word count pairs. Okay, so this is something we've done before. It's just dictionaries, reading, splitting, and then this pattern of how to accumulate in a dictionary. Then what we're going to do is we're going to make a new list called LST. And now we're doing this key value in the item. So this is going to go through the key value pairs in this list, which is the key value pairs from the dictionary. Right? But then we are going to create this temporary list of tuples that are val, comma, key. So val is like 20, the, 14, hello. And that's what the list is going to look like, right? It's going to be tuples, but it's going to be the value and then the key rather than the key and the value. This one here is key value. This one here, LST, is, is value key. Now that we have a list that's value comma key, we are just going to sort it because now it's going to sort based on the first thing in that tuple and we're going to reverse it so the biggest values are near the top. And so when we're all done, this is going to be a list except it's going to be sorted based on the value. So that's just one step to sort it. So this is a good example of how we sort of go through some work, we get a data structure, a list, the way we want it, and now we can sort of leverage the built-in sort. We had to prepare a list so we could use the built-in sort. We could do this by hand, but it'd be very difficult, but it's easier to say, I think I'll make a list, and then I'll sort it. Okay, so I, I, you know, I made two lists, basically. I made the original one, now I made this one just for the purpose of sorting. And now what I'm going to do to print out the top 10 is I am going to write a for loop val key, remember this list, LST, is value key, and I'm going to say for val key in list, using list slicing, up, starting at 0, up to but not including 10, which is indeed the first 10 items. Now I'm going to print out key value, so it's going to be like, it's going to print out the 22, you know, Fred 16, and so I'm going to first print the first 10. So this list is in val key order, the tuples are val key order, and so I'm going to print it out in key val just so that I print out in a way that makes the most sense. And so this is a simple way to do a simple histogram of the occurrence of words in a file. So again, you should know this, you should know every line, you should know every line, go back, review a couple times, but you should know you should know the meaning of every line of this. And if you do, that's really good. So, as you become more powerful and capable inside Python, you will realize that there are sometimes even shorter ways of doing things. Now, what I'm showing you here is not 
that different than what was on the previous page. It's just really dense, but you have to concentrate. So if I want you to understand what's on that previous page. If you don't understand this, don't feel bad. I'm going to explain it to you, but don't feel bad if you don't get it. Okay? So I'm just going to explain it. If it doesn't feel right to you, go back and look at the previous page. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to have a dictionary, and then I'm going to print in one line, sorted by value. So <clears throat> we'll start from the inside out. So this is a thing called list comprehension. It looks like a list constant because we start with square brackets. But this is a Python syntax that says, construct dynamically a list of tuples v comma k and I would like you to loop through the items with k and v taking on the successive values. So this is creating that reversed list where value and key are the order of the items in each tuple and it's going to do that so this is going to expand. It's sort of like it goes expands this it makes a temporary list right now. Now, if you look on the previous slide, we called that thing LST. But here we don't even call it LST. And then once we have the list of tuples in value key order, then we simply take and pass that in to sorted. This is a function call, the sorted function. And then, now I'm not reversing it, but the print statement prints out its ascending order of the value, 1, 10, 22. Okay, so this you can you can make these more dense once you're a little more comfortable with what's going on. It's sometimes easier to construct something that seems to have steps where you can put you know you can put a debug print here, you can put a debug print here, you can do a debug print here, and you kind of see what's going on, right? Whereas once you really understand this, you can you can write some more dense Python. When you when you understand this, it's okay, right? Um, so I'm not saying you're supposed to understand this, but I just want to point out that it's possible to do this in a tighter fashion. So tuples are like lists, except that you can't change them, right? You can't change lists, and uh, you can compare them, you can sort them, you can sort lists of tuples. You can't sort the, within the tuple itself. The, the, two, uh, the two values on the left-hand side of an assignment statement, uh, we can... Uh, use sorted, and we've played with sorting dictionaries by key and value. So um, that's kind of the end of this lecture. And, uh, and so at this point, I just want to kind of congratulate you on making it through the first uh, 10 chapters of the book. So I'll, uh, I'll drink a cup of tea to you. Here's your cup of tea. Here's my toast to you um, in my Slytherin cup. And so uh, it's uh, time for a uh, a graduation ceremony, so I'll give a, a little graduation speech here with my uh, graduation hat on, and this is my uh, this is my Slytherin wand, and so uh, so the reason I'm congratulating you at the end of this chapter is that at, at this point you kind of know almost you know all the fundamentals of programming. Programming really comes down to what's called algorithms and data structures. Sometimes we solve a problem by a clever series of steps that we put together, and sometimes we solve a problem by creating a clever data structure. And so the first few chapters were about algorithms, steps, loops, functions, very procedural, how you sort of create these threads of stepping and do things a bunch of times or skip around or whatever. And in the last three chapters that we've covered, we're talking about data structures. And programming power comes when you combine algorithms and data structures. Now in the next chapters, starting with chapter 11, regular expressions, we're going to learn sort of more clever ways of doing the same thing. So you kind of know how to do a lot of stuff now. From this point forward, you'll see, oh boy, that's more clever. Or we'll use a database, oh, that's more clever. But it's not fundamentally different. And so that's why it's important for you to understand before you leave this moment, to understand everything that we've covered so far. Loops, functions, strings, files, tuples, lists, dictionaries. 
because they're kind of the foundation and everything else will just kind of be a subtle refinement slash improvement. So um, once you understand that, you've kind of begun, you become a basic programmer and I like, I like poof, like I, uh, I, I like magically asperio you and turn you a pythonio and something like that. Okay, enough of the Harry Potter reference. Uh, thank you for uh, spending all this time with me. If you've gotten this far, I really appreciate it. Um, and, of course, it's really just the beginning, but I hope that it has been a good beginning. Thank you. Hello again, and welcome to Chapter 9, uh, Python Dictionaries. As always, this lecture is copyright Creative Commons attribution. That means the audio, the video, the slides, and even my scribbles. You can use them any way you like, as long as you attribute them. Okay, so this is the second chapter where we're talking about collections. And the collections are kind of like a piece of luggage in that you can put multiple things in them. Um, variables that we've talked about sort of starting in Chapter 2 and Chapter 3 were simple variables. A scalar, they're just kind of one thing and as soon as you like put another thing in there it overwrites the first thing. And so if you look at the code you know x equals 2 and x equals 4 the question is you know where did the 2 go? Right? The 2 was there, x was there, there was a 2 in there and then we cross it out and put a 4 in there. This is sort of the basic operation of the assignment statement. It's a replacement. But a dictionary allows us to put more than one thing, not using this syntax, but it allows us to have a variable that's really an aggregate of many values. And the difference between a list and a dictionary is how the values are structured within that single variable. The list is a linear collection indexed by integers 0, 1, 2, 3. If there's five of them, it's 0 through 4 very much like a Pringles can here where they're just stacked nicely on top of each other everything's kinda organized we talked about it in the last in the last lecture this this lecture we're talking about dictionaries dictionaries very powerful it's and its power comes from a different way of organizing itself internally it's a bag of values like a just a sort of just stuffs in it it's not in any order big stuff little stuff things have labels you can also think of it like a purse with just things in it. It's like it's not like stacked. It's just stuff moves around as you're going, and that's it's a very good model for dictionaries. And so dictionaries have to have a label because the stuff is not in order. There's no such thing as the third thing. There is the thing with the label perfume. There's the thing with the label candy. There's the thing with the label money. And so there's the value, the thing, the money, and then there's always also the label. We also call these key value. The key is the label, and the value is whatever. And so these pink things are all labels for various things that you can put in the purse. So you could say to your, to your purse, hey purse, give me my tissues. Hey purse, give me my money. And it, it's in there somewhere, and the purse sort of gives you back the tissues or the money. And it's Python's most powerful data collection is the dictionaries and it's uh, when you get used to wielding them you'll say like whoa I can do so much with these things and at the beginning you're just sort of learning sort of how to use them without hurting yourself um, but they're very powerful it's it's like a database it's uh, it allows you to store very arbitrary data organized in however you feel like organizing it in a way that advances the cause of the program that you're writing and we're still kind of at the very beginning but as you learn more these will become a very powerful tool for you. Uh, they Dictionaries have different names in different languages. Um, Perl or PHP would call them associative arrays. Uh, Java would call them a property map or a hash map. And uh, C Sharp might call them a property bag or an attribute bag. And so they're, they're just the same concept. It's keys and values is the concept that's across all these languages. Just a very powerful and if you look at the Wikipedia entry that I have here, you can see that it's just it's a concept that we give different names in different languages. Same concept, different names. So like I said, the difference between a list and a dictionary, they both can store multiple values. The question is how we label them, how we store them, and how we retrieve them. So here's an example use of a dictionary. I'm going to make a thing called purse, and I'm going to store in purse, this is an assignment statement, purse sub money. So this isn't like sub zero, this is sub money. So I'm actually using a string as the place. And 
So I'm going to say stick 12 in my purse and stick a post-it note that says that's my money. Candy is 3. Tissues is 75. And if I look at that, it's not just the numbers 12, 3, and 75 as it would be in a list. It is the connection between money and 12, tissues is 75, candy is 3. And in the key value, that's the key and that's the value. So candy is the key and 3 is the value. Now, I can look things up by their name. Print purse sub candy. Well, it goes finds it and asking, hey, purse, give me back candy. And it goes and finds the value, which is 3, and so out comes a 3. We can also put it on the right-hand side of an assignment statement. So purse sub candy says, give me the old version of candy, and then add 2 to it, which gives me 5, and then store it back in that purse under the label candy. So we see candy changing to 5. And so this is a place. And you could do this with a list, except these would be numbers. You could say purse sub 2 is equal to purse sub 2 plus 2, or whatever. But in dictionaries, there are labels. Now, they're not strings. Strings is a very common label in dictionaries, but it's not always strings. You can use other things. In this chapter, we'll pretty much focus on strings. You could even use numbers, and then you would get a little confused. But you can. So here's sort of a picture of how this works. So if we take a look at this line, purse sub money equals 12, it's like we are putting a key value connection. Money is the label for 12. And then we sort of move that in. And it's up to the purse to decide where things live. If we look at the next line, we're going to put the value in with a 3 in with a label candy. And we're going to put the value 75 in with a label of tissues. And when we say, hey, purse, print yourself out, it just goes and pulls these things back out and hands them to us. And what it's really, it's giving us both the label and the value. And it's necessary to do that. Because it's just like 12, 75, and 3. What exactly is that? And so this syntax with the curly braces is what happens when you print a dictionary out. The same thing happens when we're sort of printing purse sub candy, right? Purse sub candy. It's like, dear purse, go and find the candy thing. Look at that one, look at that one. Oh, yep, yep, this is candy. But the, what we're looking for is the value, and so that's why 3 is coming out here. So go look up under candy and tell me what's stored under candy. These can be actually more complex things. I'm just keeping it simple for this lecture. And then when we say purse sub candy equals purse sub candy plus 2, well, it pulls the 3 out, looking at the label candy, then adds... 3 plus 2 and makes 5, and then it assigns it back in. And then that says, oh, go, go place this number 5 in the purse with the label of candy, which then replaces the 3 with a 5. Okay? And if we print it out, we see that the new variable, or the new candy element entry, is now 5. Okay? So if we just sort of put these things side by side, we create them sort of both the same way. We make an empty list and an empty dictionary. We call the append method because we're sort of just putting these things in order. You've got to put the first one in first. So it's not telling you where. You kind of know that this will be the first one because you're starting with an empty one and this will be the second one. We put in the values 21 and 183. And then we print it out and it's like, okay, you gave me the values 21 and 183. I will maintain the order for you. There's no keys other than their position. Their position is the key, as it were. If I want to change the first one to 23, well, I say list sub 0, which is this, and then change that to 23. So this is sort of used as a lookup to find something. It can be used on either the right-hand side or the left-hand side of an assignment state. Comparing that to dictionaries, I'm going to put a 21 in there, and I'm going to put it with the label age. I'm going to put 182, put that in with the label course. So, so we don't have to like make an entry. The fact that the entry doesn't exist, it creates the age entry and sticks 21 into it. Creates the course entry, sticks 182 into it. We print it out and says, oh, course is 182 and age is 21. This emphasizes that order is not preserved in dictionaries. I won't go into like great detail as to why that is. It turns out that that's a compromise that makes them fast using a technique called hashing. It's how it actually works internally. Go Wikipedia hashing and take a look. But the thing that matters to us as programmers primarily is that list maintain order 
and dictionaries do not maintain order. They, they, dictionaries give us power that we don't have in lists. I mean, they're very complementary. Now, there's not this one that's better than the other. They're very complementary. Different kinds of data is either better represented as a list or as a dictionary, depending on the problem you're trying to solve. And in a moment, we'll, we'll be writing programs that are using both. So if we come down here and I say, okay, stick 23 into assignment statement, into DD sub, DDD sub age, well, that will change this 21 to 23. So when we print it out. So you can, this part where you look something up and change the value, you can do either way. It's just how you do it here is a little bit different. Okay? So let's look through this code again. And so I like, I like to use the word key and value. Key is the way we look the thing up. And in list, keys are numbers starting at zero and with no gaps. In dictionaries, keys are whatever we want them to be. In this case, I'm using strings. And then the value is the number we're storing in it. So we create this kind of a list with that kind, those kinds of statements. This statement creates this kind of a thing. Now, if we if we think of this assignment statement as moving data into a new into a place, a new item of data into a place, um, it's looking at this thing right here, right? It's like that's where I want to move it, and so it hunts and says, look look the key up. And that's the one that I'm going to change. And then once it knows which it's going to change, then it's going to take the 23 and it's going to put the 23 into that location. And so that's how this changes from that to that. Similarly, when we get down to here, we're going to stick 23 somewhere. And this is this expression, this lookup expression, the index expression, dd sub age, is where we're going to put it. So we're looking here. Where is that thing? Well, that thing is this entry in the dictionary. And so now when we're going to store the 23, we know where the 23 is going to go. It's going to overwrite the 21, and so the 21 is going to change to 23. Okay, so, so they're, they're kind of similar. There, there are things that work similar in them, and then there are things that work differently in them. We can make literals, constants, with uh, curly braces, and they look just like the print. That's one nice thing about Python. When you print something out, it's showing you how you can make a literal. And basically, you just open with a curly brace and say Chuck colon 1, Fred 42, Jan 100. And we're making connections, key value pair, key value pair. We print it out, and no order. They don't maintain order. Now, they might come out in the same order, but that's just lucky, right? All the ones I've shown you so far don't come out in the same order, which is good to demonstrate it. If it one time came out in the same order, that wouldn't be broken. It's not like it doesn't want to come out in the same order. It's just you don't, it's not internally stored. And you add an element and it may reorder them. You can do an empty dictionary with just a curly brace, curly brace. So I'm going to give you another example. And I'm going to show you a series of names. And I want you to figure out what the most common name is and how many times each name appears. Now, these are real people. They actually work on the Sakai project, Stephen, uh, Jen, and, uh, and Chen, and me. So these are people that are in, actually in the data that we use in this course. Okay, And so I think I'll show you about uh, 15 names. And you're to come up with a way, I'm going to show them to you one at a time, you need to come up with a way to keep track of these. Okay, So I'll just, with no further ado, I will show you the names. Okay, so that's all the names. Did you get it? You might have to go back and do it again. How did you solve the problem? What kind of a data structure did you build to solve the problem? Or did you just say, wow, that's painful. I think I will learn Python instead than solving that problem. Okay, so 
pause the pause the video if you want and write down or go back write down what you think the number of the most common name is and how many times okay now I'll show you so here is the whole list it's all of them and now that we see all of them we use our amazing human mind and we scan around and look at purpleness and and all that stuff and then we go like oh this is so much easier problem when I'm looking at the whole thing uh, and I think that the most common person is Jen and I think we see Jen I think we see Jen five times and I think CSEB is one two three and Chen Wen is one two and Stephen Marquardt is one, two, three. So the question is, what is an effective data structure if you're going to see a million of these? What kind of data structure would you have to produce? Because you can't keep it in your head. Even even this number of people, you can't. Even this no amount of data, no way you can keep it in your head. You have to come up with some kind of a variable, as it were, just like largest so far was a variable, some kind of variable that gets you to the point where you understand what's going on. And so this is the most common technique to solve this problem where you keep a running total of each of the names. And if you see a new name, you add them to the list. So CSEB, and then you give them a 1. And then you see Zhen, and you give her a 1. And then you see Chen, and you give her a 1. And then you see CSEB again, and you give him a 2. And you see and a 2, and a 2, and a 1, right? <clears throat> and so then, when you're all done, you have the mapping right, of these things. And you go, OK, let me look through here and find the largest one. That's the largest one, and so that must be the person who is the most. So you need a scratch area, a data structure, or a piece of paper, as it were. And so that's what exactly what dictionaries are really good at. You can think of this as like a histogram. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a bunch of counters, but counters that are indexed by a string. So we use a lot of this. And so this is a pattern of many counters with a dictionary, simultaneous counters. We're counting a bunch of that. We're looking at a series of things, and we're going to simultaneously keep track of a large number of counters rather than just one counter. How many names did you see total? Whatever, 12. But how many of each name did you see is a bunch of counters. So it's a bunch of simultaneous counters. So a dictionary is, is great for this. A dictionary is great for this. We, when we see somebody for the first time, we can add an entry to the dictionary, which is kind of like going, oh, CSEV1 and then Chen Wen 1. Now these don't exist yet, right? So we got CSEV 1 and Chen Wen 1. So that creates an entry and sticks a 1 in it. And then mapping between the key CSEV and the value 1, the key Chen Wen and the value 1. And then we say, hey, what's in there? Oh, we got a CSEV is 1 and Chen Wen is 1. And then we see Chen Wen second time. So we'd add another number right there. So this old number is 1. We add 1 to it and we get 2. And then we stick that back in. And then we do the calculation. We do a dump and say, oh, there's two in Chen Wen and one in CSEB. OK? So this is a great data structure for these simultaneous counters. Like, what's the most common word? Who had the most commits? Da 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 da. Now, everything we do, we have to figure out like when you're going to get in trouble with Python. When Python's going to give you the old thumbs down and say, oh, you went too far. So one thing Python does not like is if you reference a key before it exists. We'll, we'll look at in a second how to work around this. But if you simply create a dictionary and say, oh, print out what's under CSEV, it gives you a traceback. It's like, I'm going to inform you that that's not there. And it says key error CSEV. Now, the thing that allows us to solve this is the in operator. We've used the in operator to see if a substring was in a string or if a number was in a list. So, so this in operator says, in operator says, hey, ask a question. Is the string CSEV a current key in the dictionary CCC? Is the string CSEV a current key in the dictionary CCC? And it says false. So now we have it something that doesn't give a trace back that can tell us whether or not the key is there. So if you remember the algorithm, the first time you see it, you set them to 1. And every other time, you add 1 to them. So this is how we do that in Python. So here's how we implement that program that I just gave you in Python. So here's our names. It's shorter, so my slide works better. 
Here's variable, our iteration variable. It's going to you know, go through all five of these one at a time. And within the body of the loop, we have an if statement. If the name is not currently in the counts dictionary, counts is the name of my dictionary, if the name is not currently in the counts dictionary, I say counts sub name equals one. Else, that must mean it's already there, which means it's okay to retrieve it. Counts sub name plus one, we're gonna add one to it and stick it back in, okay? And so when this finishes, it's gonna add the entries and then add one to entries that already exist and not trace back at all. And when we print it out, we're going to see the counts. And literally, this could have gone a million times, and it would just be fine, and it would just keep expanding. Okay. So this pattern of checking to see if a key is in a dictionary, setting it to some number, or <clears throat> adding one to it is a really, really common pattern. It's so common, as a matter of fact, that there is a special thing built into dictionaries that does this for us. Okay, and there is this method called get. And so counts is the name of a dictionary. Get is a built-in capability of dictionaries, and it takes two parameters. The first parameter is a key name, like a string like csev or chenwen or markward. Um, and then the second parameter is a value to give back if this doesn't exist. It's a default value if the key does not exist and there's no traceback. So this way you can encapsulate, in effect, an if-then-else. If the name parameter is in the counts, print the thing out. Otherwise, print zero. So this expression will either get the number if it exists or it will give me back a zero if it doesn't exist. So this is really valuable. All right? This is really valuable. That's a really bad smiley face. So this is really valuable because it, once, once we understand the idiom, it really takes four lines of code and turns it into one line of code. Because we're going to be doing this if-then-else all the time. Now, we, and so we can reconstruct that loop a lot easier and a lot more cleanly using this idiom, right? It's something that looks kind of complex, but you'll get used to it really fast, okay? So... We have everything here is the same. We create an empty dictionary. We have five names to go through. We're going to write a for loop, and it's going to go through each of those. And then we're going to say count sub name equals counts dot get the value stored at name. And if you don't find it, give me back a zero. And then whatever comes back, either the old value or the zero, add one to that, and then take that sum and stick it in counts name. Okay. So this is either going to create or it's going to update. If there is no entry, it's going to create it and set it to 1. If there is an entry, it's going to add 1 to the current entry. Okay, so this is this line is kind of an idiom. Read about it in the book, figure it out, 